Good evening and welcome to the January 9th, 2023 Planning Commission meeting. Chair DeCarty is absent, so I will be chairing tonight's meeting. I would like to call this meeting to order and take a roll call of the commissioners present. Commissioner Barnes, I can't see you, but I understand you're here. I thought Commissioner Barnes was here. Um, okay, Commissioner Doe. Present, good evening. Uh, Commissioner Riggs. Good evening. Commissioner Schindler. Commissioner Tate. Present. Okay, let's go back to Commissioner Barnes. I thought he was gonna be here. Hi, good evening. Terrific. Okay. Happy New Year. <laughs> and I am present as well. So with six commissioners president, present, we have a quorum and we can proceed. Um, so first, I would like to ask Ms. Sandmeyer if she has any reports or announcements. Yeah, good evening, Vice Chair Harris and commissioners. I don't have any um, reports or announcements, but I'm happy to answer questions. Okay. And does anyone have from the commission have any questions for Ms. Sandmeyer at this time? before we move to public comment. Um, Vice Chair? Yes. I just have a suggestion, and that is that um, when everybody on the dais speaks, if they can speak directly into their microphones because we have trouble hearing on Zoom. Okay. Thank I you. also um, am not able to see the commissioners that are on Zoom. I'm hopeful that that will get resolved shortly because I can't see if anybody's raising their hand. So I'm just going to hope that that gets fixed. So um, I would like to call for public comment at this time. Um, under public comment, the public may address the commission on any subject that is not listed on the agenda. Each speaker may address the commission once under public comment for a limit of three minutes. You are not required to provide your name or city of residence or district, but it is helpful. The commission cannot act on items not listed on the agenda, and therefore the commission cannot respond to non-agenda issues brought up under public comment other than to provide the general information. So I think tonight we have Ms. Began, uh, and can you please explain how people may make public comment? Thank you, Vice Chair Harris. Uh, regarding procedures for communicating, the commissioners will have their webcams on for the duration of the meeting. For those presenting on an item on tonight's agenda, we kindly ask that you also turn on your microphone and webcam during your presentation for your item. And members, staff will assign you keyboard and mouse controls if you are displaying a presentation. We then kindly ask that you turn off your webcam and microphone when you're done with the presentation portion of your item, unless called upon by the, the vice chair. During the public comments period, members of the public will have an opportunity to share their comments or questions by clicking on the hand icon on your screen, upon which staff will introduce you and activate your microphone. Alternatively, for those calling into tonight's meeting, please press star nine on your keypad to notify staff that you have a comment. Um, for any members of the public who are sharing a Zoom account or phone line with another commenter during the speech, please inform staff at the start of your public comment and staff will ensure that the other commenter gets to speak after you finish your comment. With that said, I hand it back to you, uh, Vice Chair Harris. Thank you. Um, do we have any hands raised for public comment at this time? Uh, thank you, Vice Chair. Um, I do see one hand raised. Um, it's Sue Connolly. Um, so, um, uh, Sue, if you can please uh, state your name, first and last name, address, political jurisdiction in which you live, or organization affiliation. Um, you can go ahead and unmute yourself right now. Hello, Planning Commission and, uh, <laughs> uh, and Ms. Sandmeyer. Um, I'm a resident of Menlo Park and I live in the Burgess Classics area adjacent to SRI Parkline. I know you can't answer this question per se, but um, I was on the call with a number of my other neighbors um, regarding the SRI Parkline uh, agenda items last month. And uh, although the EIR portion of it was covered, the study session on the plan itself was uh, voted to move to this meeting instead since it ran till after 11 p.m. 
Um, it was, we had actually a special meeting with Mayor um, Wilson yesterday to help kind of answer some questions prior to this uh, meeting, but it was really a surprise to see that it's not on the agenda for tonight. And um, given that so many people were waiting to speak, um, I just want to note the concern about the lack of communication or what the plan might be to address this um, important topic for all of us. Uh, thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate your time. Thank you, Ms. Connolly. Do we have any other hands raised at this time? Thank you, Vice Chair Harris. Um, at this moment, there are no comments or questions. But we can give it a minute to see if there are more coming. Okay, while we're giving it a minute, um, if it would be okay, I would like to um, have Ms. Sandmeyer explain. I know we're not going to do it till the end of the meeting, but I don't want to uh, make folks that are waiting uh, wait too long to get an answer to Ms. Connolly's question because I know it's just an, a quick answer that we have. Oh, yes, thank you. So the the Parkline study session will be held in two weeks on January 23rd, and we sent out um, a public notice for that. So anyone within the, um, the quarter mile radius should have received that. And I apologize if there was um, confusion about the, about the timing of the study session. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sandmeyer. Are there any other callers at this time? Uh, Vice Chair. Uh, Harris, I can confirm that there are no public comments that have been submitted at this time. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to close public comment and move on to the consent calendar. We have one item on the consent calendar for tonight, E1, which is the minutes from the 10-24-22 Planning Commission meeting. Does anyone on the commission want to pull this item from the consent calendar? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Please go ahead, Commissioner Riggs. Thanks. The same, do they? Hmm. Um, yes, I had a, uh, a correction to the minutes and uh, I had uh, emailed it to staff. So actually, I expected to hear it tonight. Uh, it just had to do with a reference made, I think, on uh, page 23. Uh, and I'm sorry, um, Ms. Sandmeyer, would you be the one who uh, keeps note of such things? Uh, yes, I have the email um, you sent, Commissioner Rick. So I think so. That it looks like the only change is on page 21, uh, second paragraph, line eight, um, comparing 3,400 new jobs. Um, with, it should be around 1,700 7, homes. I believe that, that was the edit, and what, we can make that edit. That's correct, and, and for those present, the correction was uh, it was typed uh, 1,700 jobs compared with 3,400 jobs as opposed to 1,700 homes, and that's all. So with that correction, uh, I'll move to approve the consent calendar. Great, thank you so much for that correction, Commissioner Riggs. Do we have a second? Okay, thanks. We've got a second from Commissioner Schindler. So let's take a vote on the approval of the consent calendar. Sorry. Okay, uh, Commissioner Barnes. Yes. Commissioner Doe. Yes. Commissioner Riggs. Yes. Commissioner Schindler. Abstain as I was not present at that meeting. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Tate. Yes. And I'm also a yes. So the motion passes with six, four, zero against and chair uh, and uh, one abstention and I, Chair DeCarty absent. So now we're going to move on to the public hearing portion of this meeting. Uh, first on the agenda is F1. To consider and adopt a resolution to approve a use permit to construct a new accessory dwelling unit, ADU, with a reduced front setback of approximately six feet, where 20 feet is required, and a rear setback of three feet, 
where four feet is required in the R1U single family urban residential zoning district at 598 Hamilton Avenue. And to determine this action is categorically exempt under CEQA guidelines, section 15303's class three exemption for new construction or conversion of small structures. This um, item was continued from the meeting of December 5th, 2022. So I, my understanding is Mr. Pruder, this is your item. Are there any additions to the staff report? Good evening, uh, Mr. Chair Harris, thank you. Uh, there are no updates at this time, but I'm happy to answer any questions and the applicant is available virtually uh, for comments and remarks following me. Thank you. Okay, would the um, applicant like to make a, a presentation now or just be there for uh, to answer questions? Yeah, good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm yeah, so I'm the applicant. I'm Namatrai Sarana. I'm the owner of the house. And I just wanted to make certain comments. Um, first of all, thanks for giving me this opportunity. Um, so we are coming back from the uh, feedback that we received last month. And, uh, you know, we started this project. So I've, I've, I've owned this house for the last five years. And we started this project because uh, I understand there's a dire need for housing in Menlo Park and in general in California. I, I worked at Facebook for the last 10 years and uh, this house is just behind it. And I am aware of the dire housing need and that is exactly why we started this project. Um, um, so we wanted to build this ADU and we got this from comments. We have taken care of all the feedback that was provided to us. Um, even though the footprint of the ADU has drastically reduced, uh, but I hope this time around all the changes that we have made would be compliant and um, uh, fine with uh, what is needed. I also want to provide uh, this information that all the work has been done with feedback from the planning team. We have worked very closely with them for the last six months. I have spent about $40,000 on this project already. And uh, I would really appreciate if we are able to figure this out on how to make this work, uh, as this will also set a precedence on, uh, you know, for other homeowners on uh, uh, the viability of ADUs on their houses. Um, that's what I want to say, Shamila, if you want to add something, please add. Uh, and we'll be obviously available for any comments and questions. Um, hi, this is um, Sharmila. I'm the architect working on this project. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes, we okay. can Okay, so uh, we did increase the setback requirement since that was a concern from our last meeting. So right now we have the new, uh, the new updated ADU at 12 feet from the face of the sidewalk curb. And up, and it's six feet from the property line. And as you know, we have um, another six feet setback from the property line to the sidewalk. And that's why we have the 12 feet setback from the street sidewalk curb. Um, that is the biggest update um, that reduced our square footage much smaller. It's only 443 square feet, but we still uh, managed to have a bedroom, a, a small bedroom and a living room there. We did um, maintain the same rear setback of three feet, um, which is still gives us some more room to the adjacent property because there is really no build out at that area where we have the ADU, the neighbor's houses set back further into the property lot. So there's really like no immediate build right on the other side of the three, three feet setback. And then we also um, had to work with the flood floodplain requirements um, and we raised the ADU to be the height required per the base floodplain um, elevation that was provided to us. Okay, thank you so much um, both to the applicant um, and to the architect. Before we move to public comment, um, are there any clarifying questions that anyone from the commission has for staff uh, at this time. I'm not sure which one of you. Uh, Commissioner Schindler. Great, uh, question to staff um, as it relates to this, this being a particularly unique piece of property. Um, since most zoning presumes a four-sided piece of property, 
for a three-sided piece like this, I'm, I'm curious to better understand what determines the definition of what is front, left, right, or back. Um, is there explicit criteria uh, or is there some kind of a subjective element to it? Thank you for your question, Commissioner Schindler. Um, I could expand if necessary, but uh, the short answer is that there are objective requirements in the uh, definitions for the various types of property lines in our zoning ordinance. So it is defined as such. And basically, uh, shorthand response for how that works is that we determine the front and rear setbacks to begin with. And then from that, we determine how the sides work. And the corner side is determined by the presence of a street. So that's that's how we got to this conclusion of the three types of property lines on site. There is no interior side property line, uh, but we have a front, which is facing Hamilton, which is narrower than the property line frontage along Henderson. Henderson itself being the other street adjacent property line makes that a, um, sorry, a street uh, corner property line side, corner side property line, excuse me. And then uh, all lots need a rear property line. So that requires that third property line be a rear. Thank you. It's helpful to have that clarification because I think in this case, whether a property line was defined as a back property line or a right property line uh, is essential to the, the conversation today. So thank you for clarifying. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Riggs, did you have a question or were you just trying to point out that uh, Commissioner Schindler did? No, I had a question. No, okay. perhaps I always remember what it was. <laughs> <laughs> we can blame it on this new system. Um, there was a question from um, last month. Uh, oh, yes, the um, location of the heat pump. Was that updated? If I may, through the chair, is that, is that directed towards staff? Or the I, I think just either, but probably staff. Sure, thank you for your question, Commissioner Riggs. Uh, to clarify, we had worked with the applicant and the location is the same, but they are uh, working with us to ensure that during the building permit stage that the overall combined noise uh, created by these two uh, heat pumps, these air conditioning unit mechanisms will be in line with the requirements for the noise ordinance and uh, they will be providing necessary insulation in that stage. Noise insulation, sorry. Understood. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, any, are there any other uh, clarifying questions? Um, I have a question. Yes, <laughs> Excuse Commissioner me, Tate. To the applicant, um, and that is um, why the ch design change, and um, now the ADU is not attached to the home. Hi, um, this is Shermila answering your question, Commissioner Tate. So um, we we did not want to attach the ADU to the existing house because we are looking at um, a, probably a potential future conversion of the garage into a JDU. And um, just keeping that in mind, um, you know, in either case, if, if this project moves forward, gets approved or not, we still want to convert the garage into a JDU. So if we have this as an attached, we wouldn't be able to do that. So that's the reason we propose this as a detached. And also the other reason is that the party wall, which is now a one hour rated wall, uh, would be better and easier to construct when it is a detached element. So that way we have a uh, better fireproofing as well as waterproofing at the roof level. And now with the elevation being raised, it gives us more of an advantage because we don't have to have like a funky croquette because our wall goes a little bit higher over the existing wall and the roof and it's a better constructability detail, which is very clean. Very good, thank you. Okay, any other clarifying questions to staff or the applicant? Okay, seeing none, uh, I would like to open this up to public comment on this application. Ms. Began, do you have any hands raised from the public on this item? Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Harris. At this moment, there are no comments or questions, but we can give it a minute to see if any come in. Okay, let's give it a minute.
Okay, still no hands. Vice Chair Harris, I can confirm that no public comments have been submitted. Okay, I think we've um, we've given enough time. So I'm going to close public comment and bring it back to the dais um, to the commission for any questions or comments or motions. Who would like to speak? Commissioner Doe. Thank you, Vice Chair Harris. Um, I just want to say to the applicant, um, I appreciate the change that you made in response to the commission's comments about being very close to the property line and very close to the sidewalk there. Um, so I would be prepared to make a motion to approve. Okay, are there any other questions or, or was that indeed, um, was that indeed a, a motion? It, it was, but not to preclude any discussion. Okay, all right. So if we either have a second or some other commissioners that would like to speak. Commissioner Schindler. Thank you, Vice Chair Harris. Um, question to the applicant. I, I observed um, that in light of the requirements to, to raise the, the finished floors to, um, to meet with the, the flood proofing require, requirements, um, there are new stairs, um, a number of stairs. And I think it's, it's um, potentially visually challenging from the street to see that those stairs, at least as I'm interpreting the elevations, visually block the front door of the main house. And I was wondering if the option of, was considered to turn the stairs, um, I'm just gonna use a verbal shorthand, like 90 degrees so that they ran along the side of the front of the 82 unit. And thus were just a little bit visually, what I would assume would be a little more visually aligned with the front of the main house. Was that an option that was considered and evaluated? And if, if so, what was the what were the considerations? Um, so Commissioner Schindler, we did we did not consider that um, option, but I, I think it's a great idea and we are very open to change that and make that work because we got this as a last minute uh, comment and we accommodated it. There is about a three feet setback between the existing um, stair and the stair, but I completely agree with you and uh, we are very happy to make that revision to rotate the stair so it's lined up along the wall. And, and, and I wasn't able to sort of discern, thank you, I wasn't able to discern just from looking at the visuals whether or not that impinged on any of the other requirements, but to me I think I would love, still love to be able to see the, the front door from, from the sidewalk um, and, and moving the railing of the additional steps would, would allow for that. Yeah, absolutely. Commissioner Tate. Um. <clears throat> This is also to the applicant. I do, I, I do think that you did a great job with uh, making some modifications. Um, of course, I still would have liked to see the front push back further, um, like with a, a minimum of ten feet going back um, from this from the uh, actual sidewalk. Um, but I do appreciate that you tried to to uh, do something um, with this. Um, I am still concerned, though, that uh, we are, the applicant mentioned something about um, going forward in other ADUs projects in the uh, city. And I'm hoping that we are not going to um, set a precedence where everyone wants to have a front setback that is completely out of compliance and um, on residential uh, neighborhood streets that are, that are such as Hamilton. Um, I feel that the setbacks that are close right up on the street or on the sidewalk are um, better suited for um, transit corridors like El Camino, um, which we see in our neighboring cities uh, in uh, recent developments where the front door is right on the sidewalk. So um, again, thank you for, for um, pushing this back a bit. Although I do wish it would have been back further, but I do appreciate your efforts. That's all I got. Thank you, Commissioner Tate. Any other commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Schindler. 
um, by way of supporting a number of the comments that have already been made, thank you for making the modifications, um, adding the additional space uh, between the sidewalk and what is the front slash side of, of the ADU there. I think it's been a creative solution. Um, while I understand the technical sort of definitions that require us to label three sides of a triangle, front, back, and left, rather than front, left, and right in this particular case, um, I, I experienced that property when I looked at it, and I imagine that the neighbors experience one side of that, what we're calling the front for these analytical purposes, it's experienced as the right. Um, and that therefore getting, I, that's how I got comfortable with the 12 feet um, rather than the 20 feet. I think the neighbor next door, and I think even as you pass the property um, from the street, it's, it's experienced as the side of the structure. Um, rather than the front with the 20 foot requirements set back all the way across. Um, so with that, I am supportive of Commissioner Kate's um, motion. So um, Commissioner, Commissioner Doe's motion. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Commissioner Doe, we have, yeah, on the floor, we have Commissioner's, uh, Commissioner Doe's uh, motion to adopt, I think you, you mean to adopt the resolution to approve the use permit for the staff recommendation? Yes, okay. And now we have a second from Commissioner Schindler. Okay, so let's take a vote. But Vice Chair Harris, if I yes. may, um, just a quick sure. question. If the motion and the second include the indication by the applicant that they will re reposition the staircase, is that part of the direction? Commissioner Schindler, would you like to add that to the motion? Um, I don't think it would be a requirement in order to have the resolution pass. I think it's, vis it's, a, it's a visual preference at this case, in this context. So no. Thank you, Vice Chair Harris, member of the, of the commission. So, so I have a question. If if we uh, vote to approve the staff report, but then they the applicant decides to make this change um, that uh, Commissioner Schindler outlined, would they need to come back, or is that okay? I guess that's probably a question. I'm not sure if it's to you, Ms. Wagner, or to. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I would need to coordinate with your staff, um, Vice Chair Harris, to ensure that there's the ability to make minor, minor modifications to an approved project. Um, most uh, zoning ordinances have that ability, but I would defer to staff uh, as whether this would fall within that category and, and if, in fact, you have that ability in your zoning ordinance. Okay, so let's put that question to um, Mr. Pruder or uh, Ms. Sandmeyer. Um, excuse me, Chair. I have a I have a question slash statement prior to the staff chiming in on that. Sure. Um, so, Bellhaven experienced um, a sweep of cold enforcement where everyone had to cut down their uh, front hedges and make other adjustments so that uh, the front of the house was visible. So, in this case, um, if the stair stairwell is not moved then it will be blocking the front door, which is a problem because that's a, a code enforcement thing, right? And this is not, you can't just move the stairs like you could cut down hedges. So I think that we should think long and hard about this and whether or not it should definitely be part of, of the uh, motion because that was an issue in this community a couple of years ago. Thank you. Okay. So let's see, let's hear from staff and then let's kind of make a decision where, where we stand on this. Okay, so I think the stairs where they are are fine. It wouldn't be a code enforcement issue um, if they're approved as part of the use permit. Um, I think a minor change such as moving the stairs um, so they're kind of parallel to the ADU or along the side of the ADU, that could probably be done at staff level. Um, but it could also, it might be easier if it's incorporated into the motion, um, but it's up to the maker of the motion. So I, I'm not quite saying that it's a code enforcement issue. What I'm saying is consistency. And um, a hedge is something that can be cut um, to not obstruct the the front facade of a home and meeting the front door. However, a stairwell cannot be moved um, to do that. So I think we should remain consistent with what the burden that this community has had to endure previously. That was my point. Commissioner 
Commissioner Schindler. Um, I, I think on the basis of that feedback, um, I'm happy to suggest an amendment to Commissioner Doe's uh, recommendation that we the, the, um, amend and request that the applicant turn the stairwell um, at the front of the ADU, um, just seeking, I may perhaps seeking final positive feedback from the applicant that this is something that they, they expect would be both appealing and satisfactory to the homeowner and wouldn't mess it, wouldn't violate, wouldn't move any of the other or run into any of the other um, parameters associated with the ADU. Okay. Yes, we are absolutely okay to comply with that. Okay, thank you, uh, Commissioner Schindler and to the applicant. Um, Commissioner Tate, um, I just wanna make sure that we're, that, that you would agree with, well, I guess you can vote yes or no, but I would like you to, to just ask your uh, advice on this uh, motion with the um, change. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? <laughs> Yeah, I just was going back to you um, to make sure that this change would uh, alleviate your concerns. Um, yeah, it, it does. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor. Oh, actually, uh, let me ask uh, Commissioner Doe if she is okay with the um, change in the motion. Uh, yes, with it being amenable to the applicant and with the um, neighborhood context Commissioner Tate provided, I would like to amend my um, motion that the stairs be um, rotated. Okay, um, so we have a motion on the floor um, to uh, to accept um, to accept and adopt the resolution to approve the use permit for the staff recommendation with the addition of uh, moving the stairs. Um, do you, is that okay with you, Steph, or do you need some better language? Thank you, Vice Chair Harris. We're okay with that language, and uh, we can work with the applicant accordingly in the building on that stage. Thank you. Okay. In that case, um, we have a first and a second. Uh, let's go ahead and take a vote. Commissioner Barnes. Yes. Commissioner Doe. Yes. Commissioner Riggs. Yes. Commissioner Schindler. Yes. Commissioner Tate. Yes. Okay, I'm also a yes. So the motion passes with six, four, zero against, and uh, Chair DeCarty absent. Thank you. Now we will move on to F2. Uh, let me read that one. Consider and adopt a resolution to approve variances and a use permit to demolish an existing one-story resident and detached garage and construct a new two-story resident and detached garage on a substandard lot with regard to minimum lot, minimum lot width, depth, and area in the R1U single-family urban residential zoning district at 69 Cornell Road. And determine this action is categorically exempt under CEQA guidelines section 15303's class three exemption for new construction or conversion of small structures. The lot is less than 5,000 square feet in area, and a use permit is required to establish the maximum floor area limit. The project includes variances to reduce the front setback to 10 feet, where 20 feet is required, to allow for one compliant parking space where two spaces are required, and to increase the height of the daylight plane to 25 feet, where the daylight plane is measured from uh, 19 feet 6 inches. Uh, Mr. Turner, I think this is your project. Do you have any additions to the staff report and or do we have um, a presentation or uh, some words from the applicant? Uh, yes, thank you, Vice Chair Harris. I do not have any updates to the staff report at this time. Um, I'm happy to take questions and the applicant does have a presentation for this item. Okay, let's go ahead with the um, presentation from the applicant and then we'll get clarifying questions from the question. Please go ahead. Good evening, Chair and members of the commission. I'm Anna Felver with Thomas James Holmes and I'm presenting 69 Cornell Road on behalf of the homeowners who are here tonight. 
The proposal is to demo the existing one-story home and detached garage of 1426 square feet, to construct a new two-story home, three bed, three bath, and detached garage with an FAL of 1945 square feet and livable area of 1583 square feet. A typical maximum FAL for a lot in this area would be 2,800 square feet. However, that would be 56% of the current lot. So the range provided and the maximum FAL provided for this lot is 2,329 square feet, which would be 46% of the lot. And again, our proposed FAL is 1945. So we're within that proposal um, and max FAL. The lot is substandard in area, width, and length, which is why we're um, here for a use permit. Uh, we're in the R1U district, and it requires a 7,000 square foot area, 65 foot width, 100 foot depth. And 69 Cornell is significantly smaller than, the, than that required zoning and smaller than the surrounding lots. Uh, let's see, I have control here. If we zoom in a little bit, oops, I guess I can't zoom in. A little hard to see, Vaughn. I don't know if we can zoom at all to that into that slide. Um, I'll, I'll keep going if you can figure that out. But um, the surrounding lots, as you can see, are much larger. They range from about seven thousand to thirteen thousand square feet. Thank you. Um, and our property is forty-two thirty-eight square feet, so we're lower than five thousand square feet in area. The width and depths of the other lots are seventy. 79 feet, almost 80 feet to 130 feet long. And our lot, our property is at a max 62 feet wide and 82 feet deep. So we are, again, significantly smaller. Uh, the lot also has a different orientation, front orientation. Um, as you can see, the property faces Cornell Road and the adjacent lots are either facing Creek Drive or Harvard Avenue. And the setback requirements of these adjacent homes along Cornell are required to have 12 feet, while our lot is being required to have 20 feet in that front yard. So in addition to the size and orientation of the lot, there are major site constraints, which are why we are requesting three variances in addition to the design proposal. Uh, there is a significant slant on the property. As you can see, that left property line is going inward, taking a range from, making a range of width from 62 feet at the front to 43 at the back much more uh, limited than 65 feet minimum um, in the zoning uh, area. And this is substantially smaller to develop and constrains the design of the house footprint and location. And then even more significant than the slant are the mature established trees on site at the right and rear edges of the property, causing a limited developable area. And it's our goal with the request of these three variances, which I'll highlight in a minute, to ultimately preserve the health of these trees and design as close to the original footprint as possible to achieve that goal. So just looking at this, there's a lot going on in this site and it's a very small site. Um, the pink dash line are the required setbacks. The orange hatch that you're seeing, or red if it's red on your screen, that's the existing house footprint and existing detached garage footprint. And the blue is our proposed footprint. So as you can see, we're trying to be as similar as possible to those existing footprints already on the site. And then there's a driveway from that blue garage all the way out to Cornell Road. That's actually the existing driveway location. And we're trying to improve on that same location so that we don't impact the trees. So our first variance that we're requesting is to reduce that front yard setback from 20 feet required to 10 feet. And this is to pull that proposed home away from the two established trees in the rear and to allow for the, the improvement in the driveway, not a relocation of the driveway, so we can retain two trees that are on the right, right hand side. And this allows the house to match the existing home, which is currently around 10 feet from the property line. And this aligns with the left adjacent neighboring home. Um, that it, it's a, uh, if you go to the next slide, can I go to the next slide? There we go. I think I can. Go, that works. Um, at, at, by sorry, moving around here. There we go. 
So in the diagram on the left here is our proposal of the 10 foot from the property line. And we're able to achieve a 20 foot clearance from that tree three in the back. And I'm showing the estimate of that, that tree canopy as well. And we're about 11 to 14 feet from the trees one and two. Uh, if we re relocate the house, which is shown in the right di diagram in yellow, this allows us to be in that 20 foot um, setback and the side within the side setbacks, but we're less than 10 feet away from those trees. And this would require the removal of the trees. So as you can see, um, you know, the tree canopy line is desirable for the neighborhood and our homeowners and our goal is to retain them. Let's see if I can go to the next slide. And these images show that tree canopy and how large they are. Be a huge impact to remove them. And I'm going to jump down past our findings. This has all been in your um, the, uh, the supporting documents for your package. Uh, and I just wanted to highlight certain items in them. As we go to variance request number two, we're requesting a second variance. This is for one compliance space where two is required. Our proposal is for a detached one car garage on site where the current garage is located uh, with a uncovered tandem space in front due to the limited vehicular access. This is to retain the existing driveway without further expanding into um, the root zones of trees one, two, and three, and um, which would cause greater impacts to the roots and of course uh, would be detrimental to the health of the trees. We also wanna lessen the impact on tree three by building within the footprint not expanding outside of that existing garage footprint. So putting in a two car garage um, would be quite difficult uh, without impacting tree three. So we have two diagrams here, one on the left, our proposal, and then the right showing those alternate um, parking spaces um, to see if we could be compliant on the site. And by proposing a uh, one car garage, we're able to maintain the clearance from trees two and three. Um, and then these additional uncovered parking spaces would be clearly, we'd have to expand the driveway out to where tree three is located, it'd be way too close to that tree. And then you can see the access of these lines. If you're trying to get out of that parking space, you'd be hitting the garage corner and the other trees on the right-hand edge. So there's not really this radius that's required for that access of those parking spaces. So again, the variance would allow us to retain the trees on site. skipping through to variance three. We're requesting the third variance. Um, it's an increased vertical daylight plane. The daylight plane with this example elevation drawing, as you know, five feet from the set, from the property line, we have a daylight plane that goes up vertically 19 foot six, then angles off at a 45 degree angle and levels off at the 28 foot max. Uh, it's since our property line on the left hand edge, slants inward, that daylight plane slants inward. So our house, though within the setbacks and within the daylight plane at the front of the home, as you're at the back corner of that home on that setback line, you can see in the lower diagram below, there's a white piece of the home that does intrude into that daylight plane. And that would be about two feet of the wall and part of the gable and roof line that intrudes. So the diagram Isometric diagram to the right shows that 25 foot increase on that left property line that would allow us to be within the daylight plane. And this is to avoid alternate home locations that would cause relocation of the driveway and the garage and would result in the removal of the trees, which we're trying to retain. And then also avoiding us to lose half the second floor plan, which would be pretty detrimental in square footage. So here's the exhibits showing the different uh, floor plan locations on the left hand edge, there is a hatch line. So we have to be several feet away from that um, uh, left setback line to make sure that we're out of that daylight plane. And the orange shows, well, if we move the house all the way over to the right, we lose trees one and two, and that garage would make us lose tree three. If we were to have the home just outside of that um, hatch area on the left hand edge to be out of the daylight plane um, or within it, um, the driveway would have to shift over, the curb cut would have to move, the, the garage would have to move, we still lose trees one and two. And then if we looked at dropping the plate height and you know uh, revising our design to accommodate 
we'd be dropping our plate height from nine to six foot nine. Um, and with that angle and it, it, it just would not be um, compliant. So we'd actually lose that bedroom bathroom and that would be pretty detrimental in square footage for our homeowners. So by proposing an increase along that slanted edge, our proposed home can be built within the side setback and remain clear of the other side constraints retaining the trees. And then I'll just talk for a little bit about our design on this page. Uh, the style of the neighborhood is a mix of two-story and one-story homes. They have cottage styles. There are a few Spanish and a lot of traditional. A mix of lap siding, shingles, stucco and brick are, are used as well. And there's traditional roof lines and pitches. So the proposed home is a traditional cottage home. Materials consist of lap siding and brick. And we have a similar layout as the existing home, as you saw on the footprint. And we're providing a projecting living space with a long front porch adjacent. We have some traditional columns, a decorative railing. Shutters are applied to the second story. And the roof is that shed and gable, which is in alignment with the neighborhood. There are window grids, and we are proposing them to be SDLs with spacer bars to make sure that we're compliant with um, the design of Men design guidelines of Menlo Park. And the color selection is a beige with the white trim, dark, dark accent on the doors and shutters to match the, the dark window frames. So this we believe this elevation will be a great addition and blend in the neighborhood. And to conclude our presentation, we ask that you approve the design with the three variances requested as this again allows us to build thoughtfully on the property, retaining that beautiful tree canopy enjoyed by all and providing a size and style that fits within the neighborhood. So thank you for your time tonight and allowing us to present this project. We have our team here to answer any questions and we also have our homeowners on the call, Matt and Victoria. Um, we'd like them to quickly introduce themselves. Thank you. Hi, good evening, um, and uh, thank you, commissioners, for your time. My name is Matt Normington, and I'm joined here by my wife, Victoria. Uh, we're the owners of uh, 69 Cornell. Um, just a little bit about us. When I was in seventh grade, my family moved to Menlo Park and absolutely loved the community. Um, my parents lived here up until recently for the last 30 years, um, in fact. Um, I, since I, I, when my sister and I both attended um, the Menlo Park schools, I had since gone off to college, got a job, lived in different places. Victoria and I got married, had a baby. And in 2019, we moved back to the area and have lived in Menlo Park for the last, um, since, since 2019, last four years. Um, we, uh, our son is now seven and he attends uh, Ensenal. He's a first grader in Ensenal. Um, we're very, very committed to the city of Menlo Park. We love the community. And we're extremely excited about our project on Cornell. Um, so we, uh, we again appreciate your time and thank you in advance for your consideration of our project. Thank you. Thanks for um, introducing yourselves. Okay, so I'd like to bring it back to the dais and if there are any clarifying questions, either for staff or for the applicant, um, we could entertain them at this time. Okay, seeing none. Oh, seeing one, Commissioner <laughs> Riggs. Yes, thank you. Uh, I guess this would be a question for Mr. Turner. Um, on reviewing this site, um, what size home is currently on this? Um, I was going to call it a half lot, but it's less than half a lot. Um, compared with the neighbor homes, what, what size home is on there now? Um, if I'm not mistaken, I believe it's about 900 square feet. I can pull up the plans real um, quickly. Are the adjacent homes larger than 900 square feet? Uh, the adjacent homes are fairly large. Um, the I don't have the exact square footage on hand, but I know the lots themselves are um, I get eight to 12,000 square feet. Um, and the homes are uh, pretty standard size homes for the, that size lots. They're, they're fairly large, definitely larger than 
Are homes on that size lot like 2,000 square feet, 2,500, something like that? Um, for hypothetically on a 10,000 square foot lot, um, your floor area limit would be about uh, about 3,200 square feet, roughly, uh, maximum build out. All right, so the others are rather a different scale from the existing home there. All right, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Riggs. Are there any other clarifying questions? Okay. Now seeing none, I would like to open it up for public comment on this um, application. Ms. Began, do we have any hands raised from the public on this item? Thank you, Vice Chair Harris. At this moment, there are no comments or questions. We can give it a minute to see if any come in. Okay, maybe short minute. I think there's been plenty of time. Okay, still no hands? Uh, I can confirm there are no public comments. So. Okay, thank you. So I'm gonna close the public comment and bring it back to the commission for any uh, questions, comments, uh, who would like to make a comment? Um, Commissioner Riggs. Thank you. Um, couldn't possibly make a comment. There are lots of comments to make. Um, this is such an interesting project. Um, I want to say up front that uh, I find this design to be quite attractive uh, and uh, also rather appropriate to allied arts. Um, with the possible exception of, um, I think that is a stone facade on the upper floor gable. Um, and I'm not sure how that slipped through, but I, I hope I hope we won't see that again. Um, but to the really core of the project here, this project is designed to be as attractive on the market as it can be, and that, of course, is understood, and that's the job of the architect. Um, and the job of Ms. Felber is to sell it. And I understand that. And I have known for a couple of years that Ms. Felber is very good at um, selling a project. Um, but I'm in this position of having to make findings with honesty um, and level of continuity. And um, it's very hard to make a finding that I can go by the smallest house on the street, on the smallest lot on the street, for the smallest amount of money on the street, and then go to a planning commission and say, oh my, it turns out this is a small lot. I need variances in order to build what I always wanted to build. I, I have to say, just in terms of fairness, that really rubs me the wrong way. Um, and while I don't want to say that this is intended, but this is just the, the result of trying to put one kind of a product onto another kind of a lot. And this wasn't a $5 million lot, this is a $2 million lot. Um, and, and of course, I'm just pulling these numbers out of the air, but I mean, it's 40% of the lot. My first house was 40% of the lot on the corner. Um, it was a charming house, although all the time I had it, it never did exceed a thousand square feet. Um, and it doesn't today as I had it. I recall from Google. So, I will go through the required findings, or more exactly, I'll go through the required requests, since unfortunately I don't have the findings behind for me or a way to scroll through uh, the application while I talk. Um, so the first request regarding the front setback, um, I can see how that could be compatible with the street, since it happens that 
there are two side setbacks next to this property just because it's on a short block. Um, however, I would still have to make the finding that says that one could not uh, exercise fair and equal rights um, for having bought a small, a small lot as the large lots have. Um, I mean, if I could make that argument, I'd have quite a lot of house in my 5,000 square foot lot, but I can't, and I don't think anyone else can. Um, then regarding the daylight claim, um, it's not in the staff report, but this house is actually quite close to meeting the daylight claim. In fact, I was truly surprised to see that the daylight claim request was to change from 19 feet to 25 feet. This house is within two feet of meeting the current zoning regulations because a gable can protrude into a daylight claim. And that happens to be the end of the house that's in question. The fact that the back corner is two feet wider than allows it to stay at the wall to stay within the setback. That is a problem. Again, I would love to have two feet more on the side property line of my house, but um, I don't get to ask for that. Um, because that's the size lot I bought. Um, and then finally, regarding the parking space, I feel like I must be missing something. We're going to demolish a two-car garage, then build a one-car garage because a two-car garage doesn't fit. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm missing something. The fact that a change in the foundation, for example, if it's an 18 foot wide, uh, parking, uh, 18 foot wide garage instead of 20 feet. Um, there are foundation designs that are intended for building adjacent to uh, a tree canopy. And they're used all the time and they are frequently a planning division uh, request based on an archivist report. Um, and so the flexibility is there. Frankly, though, if this applicant came to this commission and asked that their two-car parking be allowed to be 18 feet wide instead of 20 feet wide, I would find that much easier to make on the grounds of not disturbing the trees, because at least it's proportional. Um, to, to ask that there only be one parking space when our code still requires two, and only one has to be inside, by the way. Um, that just isn't justified and is not appropriate. There are those of us that hope that our parking requirements will be reduced in the future, but at this time, for your project, and for the project that comes after and the project that comes in two weeks, the requirement is still parking spaces, too. Um, so with that, I simply could not make finding number two finding. Um, and I cannot see a way of approving the laundry list of requests for, um, for this proposed home. Thank you, Commissioner Riggs. Uh, I'd like to hear from any other commissioners on this project. Commissioner Schindler. Thank you, Vice Chair Harris. Um, I think I would like to start just by thanking the applicant for the depth of documentation. Um, very often I find myself trying to imagine other options that were considered and evaluated. Um, and I think I can do it here in this context fairly clearly. Um, I appreciate the, the the sentiment that this is certainly acknowledged and, and there's no, it, this is the 
a small, small lot on the block, um, unusual in the block, unusual in the neighborhood. Um, and when I went through and considered each of the findings related to each of the variances, um, I found them in most cases, I found them to be supported. Um, so starting with the setback, um, as well as the parking um, and the daylight plane. I think the, the setback to me, again, considering the position of the two neighboring, the, ex the, existing, the existing setback, the comparable side setbacks of the two adjacent properties and the experience one would have walking along the street. Um, and that's, those seem like a positive experience for the community, the neighbors, and the homeowners that were aligned there. Um, the daylight plane, um, I think, is is to my to my analytic eye, the proposal looks like it worked. The, 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 the find it looks like the findings support the variance request. Um, I'm unable to come up with sort of another proposal for how better to do it, um, possibly just from lack of creative thinking about it. So I would love to hear if there are other commissioners who have another proposal. Um, and on the parking, I think this this particular this group has on a number of occasions and a number of different contexts, as Commissioner Riggs alluded to, um, supported the idea of dialing it back parking requirements in a number of different contexts. Um, and so this particular variance request, again, seems aligned with the direction of regulation. It seems like it's aligned with the values of the community, the neighborhood, and the homeowner. So those are my comments. Thank you, Commissioner Schindler. Would anyone else like to make a uh, Commissioner Doe? Um, thank you, Vice Chair Harris. Um, I'm going to agree with Commissioner Reyes and Schindler on the side setback, the rationale. I feel comfortable because it's on the side and aligns with the um, neighbor with the tender setback. Um, but I would like to feel like I always read, you know, see something like, oh, less parking. And I, I have to agree with what Commissioner Riggs said that even though we don't want to create a city for cars. Um, we recently had a project where we spent a lot of time, um, you know, talking about the design and, you know, paving in the front and entry to get that second compliance space. And I would never say I would argue for that, but I also understand that our role as planning commission um, is to implement the rules. So that moment, I, not sure yet what exactly I'm you know trying to express on that, except that I would hate to be consistent in sorry, inconsistent when um such a project is fresh on my mind, at least. And then to the daylight plane, to Commissioner Riggs' comment that they're very close, the applicant is very close to being um within compliance with the daylight plane. I would just like to just push back and ask of the applicant if um you know there's some way that they could retain that third bedroom, um, could it work with that gable intrusion and not um, have to request a, a variance for that um, from the daylight plane? Um, but overall stepping back, I wouldn't fault a, a pro homeowner for having a small property. At the same time, you would want to build the appropriately sized home given the lot you have and not try to shoehorn maybe too much. Um, so I, I would like to ask that question of the applicant about um, some possible design changes so that you're not trying to shoehorn the home and if it's possible to make some of those changes that would make it compliant in that regard. And this is specifically um, on the daylight plane? Yeah, we're now for the daylight plane, yes. Okay. okay. All right, to the applicant, thank you. Yeah, regards to that daylight plane, um, in order to get 
over that wall of two feet and the gable height, we'd have to shift the whole house over five feet to get out of there. And that's just because of that slantedness, the the way the gable and the eave and the wall are all intruding. And um, so we'd have to shift the house over and just shifting the house over even a foot, let alone several feet, moves that entire driveway over, which results in the removal of the two could, trees. Uh, could we pull up, um, could we, we pull that up so we can take a look at that? Through the chair, could staff explain the daylight plan intrusion? I'm not sure that all commissioners are familiar with the, the exception and the regulation. Is that a question to staff? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. That would be fine. And then, uh, in the meantime, let's also pull. Let's pull that up so we can take a look because there seems to be some disagreement about what could or could not be done. Okay. Um, so what Commissioner Riggs is uh, referencing, there's a section that talks about the daylight plane, how it's measured. Um, and then the, the code allows for certain uh, intrusions into the daylight plane. Um, so for example, if the setback is um, five feet, which is the case here, um, dormers, gables, um, those sorts of architectural um, features of the building are allowed to encroach into the daylight plane a certain amount, um, up to 10 feet laterally into um, the daylight plane, um, and then for a length, a wall length of up to 30 feet. Um, but there's a certain, there's a very specific way that the intrusion is calculated. Um, it's basically, it has to fit within this triangle that has a complicated definition. It's basically where the base of the triangle is where the, the daylight plane intersects with the wall of the building. Um, and then uh, whatever the length of the building is, you take the um, form a triangle at the end points of that line. Um, if that's helpful, that's, that's the daylight plane intrusion allowance. Okay, thank you. Um, we now have this pulled up. Uh, I think I would like to uh, ask Commissioner Riggs to um, state what I think he was stating a minute ago. <laughs> You were, yeah, that you were disagreeing with what with the applicant as to what was possible. Yeah, if you don't mind, I, I, I don't. Um, I don't have a plan in front of me, and I also am not comfortable with designing from the DS, but um, because just because it seems unfair to the architect. But uh, the main problem with the intrusion here is the vertical wall, not the roof line. Uh, because the roof line constitutes a gable and therefore it has an exception. Um, so in effect, what would happen is the back left corner of the second floor would have a notch taken out. There's a two foot uh, intrusion, not into the setback, but into the daylight plane. But there would, it would be illogical to move the entire house. One would simply take a notch out of the second floor. Um, that, of course, would reduce a room size by two feet. And that's meaningful to the design, no question about it. Um, but additional space can be found on the second floor, um, for example, by cantilevering that the width of that room uh, to the back. Um, I sent Mr. Turner, in fact, uh, a picture of just such a project, uh, which had just such a problem. Um, and uh, we haven't even talked about another option uh, for keeping a roof out of a daylight plane, which is lowering the plate height. Um, I have personally done more than one project, and I think I have also seen a project here at the Planning Commission that had a seven foot six or even a seven foot plate height. 
and yet the interior spaces were quite attractive. That's because that plate height is at the low end of the gable. And you have your eight foot height as soon as you back away from the wall. And um, when you have a gable, you also have the opportunity of a so-called cathedral ceiling. And so the uh, feeling that the wall is low is completely missed um, by uh, the presence of the volume. Um, uh, actually, I sent a couple of pictures to Mr. Turner this afternoon for that too. Uh, at the end of the afternoon, I'll point out, so it certainly wouldn't be possible that he could prepare some kind of information for us tonight. Um, so those are options that um, are, are actually um, have already been used, and I'm, I'm reporting them as observations, not um, you know uh, ideas out of the sky, um, which I would, would not want to do. Um, similar to the foundation issues for the um, garage, we've had several projects here that came with a um, arborist report that said since this foundation will be close to the trees and we don't know where the trees are, it shall use hand digging or water glass digging. And then when roots are found over a certain size, the foundation shall bridge the roots, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so these issues that are presented here tonight, uh, they, they can all be addressed uh, by design. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Riggs. Uh, are there any other commissioners who would like to speak? Commissioner Doe. Thank you, I just wanted to wrap up my, um, thank, you, thank you to the applicant for um, responding and uh, Commissioner Riggs for interjecting there. Um, I did forget to say, I really appreciate the care with which the trees have been treated. So the last thing I would argue for is that the house be shifted over. Um, and again, I just hope the applicant, um, you know, has any other commissioner's comments. I wonder if they can take some of the observations shared by Commissioner Riggs as to the design and geometry of the house and not just a simple shifting over of the mass as is, um, I do think the preservation of the trees that has been shown is something to um, hold fast to. Thank you. Okay, are there any other commissioners who would like to speak um, or give, give some thoughts on this item? Um, I myself find, um, I, while I appreciate all of the comments, I um, am finding myself feeling comfortable with the staff's um, analysis analysis of this project, um, but I would like to see if there are any other commissioners who would like to um, weigh in. Commissioner Tate. Um, I just want to um, um, acknowledge Commissioner Riggs's uh, comment earlier, and it's it's very similar to um, what he made when uh, we first saw the Hamilton ADU, and that is that um, all lots aren't suitable for for um, certain development or being overbuilt, and I do think that. Um, that that is true, even though as homeowners and you know landowners, we want to do um, the maximum um, that we can afford. Our lots are not always suitable, and um, and that is a challenge because again, I uh, like you, Vice Chair, uh, feel relatively comfortable with this project, um, but I do think that um, that. Commissioner Riggs' statements are are definitely something we're thinking about um, when uh, folks are trying to develop their land. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Tate. Um, I think I'd like to actually go back and ask the applicant, given some of the um, thoughts of some of the commissioners, I'd like to understand from the applicant if there are any changes that you would want to consider based on some of the comments uh, from the commissioners. 
I'd like to bring Chris Turner back on to helping with the daylight plan because if it's it was our understanding that the full gable eave wall component needed to be could not intrude into this daylight plane. Um, so with with that in mind, I, if there's a better way to clarify that condition a bit more. I know that you've written that in your comments that we've gone back and forth on on this item. That would be great. And then um, then I can answer and bring bring my architect to answer about design solutions and resolution to it. Through the chair. Okay. Yes, please go ahead. Um, yeah, so I think potentially um, what you might be talking about was, was my comments about the way in which to ask the, for the variance for the daylight plane. Um, the variance request is to raise the height of the daylight plane. And in that case, everything needs to kind of be within that um, requested daylight plane height. Um, there are allowances for the daylight plane intrusions for, for gables and dormers um, that Commissioner Riggs and I explained earlier. Uh, but for the for purposes of the variance um, request, everything needed to be within that requested height for the daylight. Okay, thank you for <laughs> explaining that because that's a portion of um, how we're presenting this variance. Um, and that two foot of wall, um, that again, um, these rooms are, are, are still tight. This is I think 11, a little bit 11 by 11. Um, so pulling that room in two feet does make it not a room. So there is this tightness in, in, um, in this plan and we'd be um, significantly reducing that. Could we have a head height that it starts at six, nine and slopes up? Well, you're still losing that head height for two feet. So um, that those are things that design items that we looked at and that this variance was really important to have to allow us to have that two feet of wall in that plane as it's just in that corner. We're seven feet away at the front. So being outside that daylight plane at the front, we're significantly within. It's just that back corner that gets really tight. Um, so reducing the plan just seemed um, very detrimental and in, in, because it's sloping inward so much. Um, solutions to that we can look into sloping the height of the, of the ceiling if that is uh, the desire of the commission and we can um, it, at least get that corner to 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 work with the daylight plane but it is going to uh, definitely change the floor plan moving forward so um, at that sec that at least that ceiling height and if that would be an item that could be conditioned that would be great as well um, as we don't want to change the, the main items of this home, it would be more of that corner and how does that slope work? Thank you, uh, Commissioner Schindler. Thank you, Vice Chair Harris. Um, I have a clarifying question for Commissioner Briggs because I appreciate the, the depth of this conversation has gone into just in clarifying uh, the topic in which we're speaking, but also refining what the possible options being evaluated here tonight are. Um, so, Commissioner Riggs, am I under, I, just understand that whether are we talking about trying to define an intrusion that's acceptable or no intrusion at all into the daylight plan? I think you had used your, your expertise to come up with a couple of possible options. Um, which of those two criteria, which of those two uh, acceptable level of intrusion or no intrusion? Were you was was potentially being addressed was was the goal was the outcome of those proposals? Well, that's easy as an architect. Uh, if the intrusion is allowed ten feet high and thirty feet wide, that's what I'm taking. That's the rules, and you should be able to do that. Um, so that's why there's this temptation when I look at the diagram and I say, "Darn, you're so close." The only real conflict you have, uh, I'm not sure that uh, that even exceeds the 10 foot by 30 foot. I, ha I haven't asked Mr. Turner, but it, frankly, it looks smaller. 
Uh, and uh, so it's just that uh, the wall doesn't qualify for the exception. So you tuck the wall back um, two feet. Um, or alternatively, you lower the uh, uh, plate line, as has been done. I think I mentioned three examples. Um, and then uh, it requires other changes to the plan, but you can make up for some of that space uh, with a cantilever to the rear. Um, and actually, it looks rather charming. Um, in fact, those were done uh, on purpose, um, I guess, in the early 19th century um, um, European architecture. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to see where we are. Um, we've talked a lot about the daylight plane. If we are able to come to an agreement on the daylight plane, um, we still have two other issues. And I'm just wondering uh, where the rest of the commission would feel about those other two issues if we were able to solve the daylight plane commission. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to make a motion. I, th I think, again, as I said, I think this is a very attractive project. Um, and so I'd like to propose that we continue the project um, and um, give the architect a fair chance to, one, look at this daylight plane now that it's better understood, uh, and two, to reconsider the garage um, being more or less uh, similar to what the existing garage is. Um, and then if others feel that um, uh, the 10 foot setback should be 12 feet, um, uh, I don't feel strongly about that. Um, but uh, if I were to make a motion, well, I will make a motion that it be continued uh, to um, bring those two things into line, the parking and the um, and the daylight plane. Well, and again, it doesn't require a two-car garage. We don't require that. We require a one-car garage with an additional parking space. Um, and as I guess it was Ms. Doe pointed out, we've had two projects just in the last year where we went to quite some issues, putting a parking space rather unfortunately in the front yard, and I guess hoping that no one will ever actually park there. In this case, it's the backyard. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Riggs. I want to just clarify that um, what we would be, we would be continuing really to work on the two issues, the garage and um, the daylight plane. And in your motion, would you like to express that you would be fine with the current um, setback variance, which I think is variance number one? It's probably most appropriate for me in my motion just not to say anything about it. <laughs> Set back. You're right. Stop talking. Okay. So uh, we've got a motion on the floor to continue the project so that the architect can go and the applicant can go back and take a look, especially at variances two and three. I think they're two and three, the daylight plane and the uh, garage. Um, so would anyone like to second that motion? A second. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Tate. All right, so then I'm going to take a vote on this motion uh, uh, first by Commissioner Riggs and a second by Commissioner Tate. So, Commissioner Barnes. Yes. Commissioner Doe. Yes. Commissioner Riggs. Yes. Commissioner Schindler. Yes. Commissioner Tate. Yes. Okay, and I will vote yes as well. So uh, that motion to continue passes. Uh, thank you again to the applicant. I think a lot of work has done was done on this project, and, but not all the commissioners could see clearly to uh, meet all those variances um, at this time. So we really appreciate if you could um, come back and see us uh, once, uh, once you've had a little chance to work on that and are able to get back on the calendar. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, so that completes that um, item of the public hearing. We are now on F3.
which is to consider and adopt a resolution to approve a minor subdivision to reconfigure property lines and create three parcels from two existing parcels in the R1S single family suburban residential zoning district at eight and 10 Maywood Lane and determine this action is categorically exempt under the CEQA guidelines section 15315 class 15 exemption for minor land divisions. Two of the resulting lots would be standard and the third new lot would be substandard lot with regard to the lot width. So I would like to ask, I think it's Mr. Pruder, um, if there are any additions to the staff report and um, if we have an applicant uh, present that uh, would like to say something. Good evening again, Vice Chair Harris. Thank you. Um, there is an update to start with. Um, earlier this afternoon, I had circulated uh, via email a public comment letter that was provided after the staff report publication. And in that uh, public comment letter, the, the main focus of it was concern uh, with the discrepancy between gross lot area and net lot area and uh, concerns with the determination of the lot sizes as a result of that regarding the three lots that were created. And uh, in addition to that, to clarify, uh, we have the property owner in person in the council chamber this evening, and we have the um, engineer staff, uh, the folks who drawn up the plan, the tentative map drawings available virtually. And uh, yes, we have Alex there. Um, and they can um, assist. I don't have any other uh, updates besides that. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions. And then following that, you can segue to the applicant presentation. Thank you. OK, are there any clarifying questions from the commission to staff at this time? OK. Uh, I guess not. So um, if the applicant wants to say um, a few words, um, I think it's pretty clear, but we would uh, love to hear what you have to say if um, you wish. The floor is yours. Hi, commissioners. This is Alex for hearing our proposal. Um, as uh, Mr. Pruder mentioned, I'm Alex Henson with Lee and Braze Engineering. Um, and thank you for your staff report. We feel like you very clearly and concisely um, demonstrated the project and highlighted all of what we're trying to propose. Again, we're looking for a minor subdivision to create three parcels from the existing two parcels at 8 and 10 Maywood. Um, we've worked very closely with the staff over the past two to three years for this project and I'm proud of the proposal we have in front of you tonight. Um, we've gone through a number of revisions with the town to meet all of the city's general plan requirements, the subdivision ordinance and general guidelines. Um, with that, we'd like to take a minute just to review the noted nonconformity for the created lot facing San Mateo Drive. Um, as mentioned, this lot is nonconforming in lot width at 75 feet. This nonconformity is an existing condition with the boundary of the neighboring parcel at 6 Maywood and the neighboring property at 340 San Mateo Drive. The proposed subdivision does not increase this nonconformity in any way. And the next three neighboring parcels at 340, 312, and 306 San Mateo Drive all share this same width at 75 feet. Uh, we also understand, as was brought up, that there is a new concern for the size of lot that's uh, the new 8 Maywood property. Um, as you know, mentioned, we've worked very closely with the town over the guidelines over the past couple of years. Uh, this new lot is created at a total gross area of 10,000 square feet as required. Um, in looking at the neighboring parcels, um, 265, 245, 225 San Mateo Drive all have gross lot areas from 7,800 to 8,400 square feet. And on a further review at a larger scale, there's around 209 homes in the area of West Menlo Park that have been sold in the last years that have total gross areas of less than 10,000 square feet, 50 of which are within a half mile of the proposed eight mid wood, main wood lane. Um, it's also important to look at um, our C 1.0 sheet in your package. Um, as you can see, there is an access easement, the easement in question that transitions from a total of 40 feet wide along the frontage of eight mid wood lane, decreases to 16 just after that, and then further reduces to eight feet after that. 
Um, in conclusion, the proposed subdivision will help much, you know, the needed housing requirements in the area. Um, we've met with the town, we met all of their guidelines and found their support. Um, and with that, we'd like to ask for your approval today and I'm available for any questions as well as um, any clarification that may be required. Thank you, uh, Mr. Henson. If we have the applicants um, in the room, if you would like to come up and just say, introduce yourself, say a word, that, that would be fine. Uh, thank you, Vice Chairman Harris and uh, commissioners. Uh, I'm Jeff Huber. I'm the owner of 8 Maywood Lane. Um, I've also been a longtime resident of Maywood Lane, uh, specifically next door at 11 Maywood Lane. Uh, my wife and I, Moved there in 1999 uh, and raised our family. Uh, two kids, uh, now college age, that went to Oak Knoll School and um, Hillview Middle School. Uh, we've been longtime members of the community and really love uh, the community. Um, unfortunately, my wife, Laura, uh, passed away in 2015 um, after a bout of cancer. Uh, I've since remarried in 2019, uh, now have a blended family. And uh, the size of the blended family with an additional two kids and uh, live in 80 year old grandmother um, uh, made it so that uh, we couldn't quite fit in our historic home at the end of Maywood Lane at 11 Maywood Lane. Uh, so we moved out of the neighborhood, but are still uh, very nearby in the area uh, have retained our home at 11 Maywood Lane that we have now um, uh, been in long term rental with. Uh, so we're frequent visitors to the lane. Uh, we understand the, the letter that was received. I'm a little bit disappointed and, and surprised at the concern or objections given our long time involvement in the lane and our deep care for, uh, uh, for the community. Uh, part of the reason that we actually acquired other properties on Maywood Lane was because of precisely that concern of not wanting um, developers to come in with aggressive plans. Uh, that would be inconsistent with the fit and, and style and community the expectations of Maywood Lane. Uh, this has been a project that has uh, taken a while to, to come to fruition. We started over two years ago, uh, had some challenges with COVID, had an arborist that moved out of the area and dropped the project. Um, uh, but we really appreciate the hard work of uh, Matthew Pruder and the, and the planning team uh, to get it to this point. Um, as Alex mentioned, uh, we've worked also closely with Lee and Braes, uh, who've been very professional and thoughtful and thorough in this process. Uh, we've tried in, um, in the effort to be as thoughtful and considerate as we possibly could be around the standards of it. I've tried to comply with all of the guidelines. As uh, Alex mentioned, we did do upon hearing the concerns, some research of what is the precedent uh, in the immediate area and found over you know, 200 homes uh, that have similar lot sizes or smaller lot sizes than the ones being proposed. Um, in terms of access to the property, we've also tried to be thoughtful of making sure that anything that would be designed in the future would uh, fit well with uh, the lot size uh, allowed. Um, and as a clarification, there are no immediate plans for development. This is just the, the lot split and lot line adjustment uh, to enable either future development or future sales. So I'm sure that any future uh, plans would come back uh, to the commission and, and planning staff to make sure that they're appropriate and aligned with uh, the requirements and also the expectations of the community. So with that, we would truly appreciate your, your support. And uh, again, many thanks to the planning team for all the hard work that's gone in. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate your coming, uh, especially in person. I'd like to go to public comment, but just I uh, just want to check to make sure that there aren't any clarifying questions to the applicant from any of the commissioners before we do that. Okay, um, then at this time, let's um, go to public. Let's open up public comment um, on this application. Ms. Began, do we have any hands raised? Um, uh, thank you, Vice Chair Harris. At this moment, uh, there are no comments or questions, but we can give it. Oh, here we go. Um, I see one. So uh, I'd like to introduce Wendy McPherson. Um, 
Um, as a reminder, you'll have three minutes to share your comment or question. Please clearly state your first and last name and address, political jurisdiction in which you live, or organization affiliation. You can go ahead and turn on your mic. Ms. Began, is that somebody from that's present here or someone? Oh, sorry, that was online. Yeah. Okay. So someone online. So and just to clarify, if you are here in the chambers and want to comment, um, are you, do we need a comment card or are you? Um, you can just check first. Okay, because I, I see somebody with a comment card. <laughs> okay. Yeah, um, I, I introduced Wendy McPherson okay. uh, and I'm uh, asking her to unmute. Okay, so we'll do online first and then, then go to someone in chambers. Thanks. Uh, Wendy, would you like to unmute and speak? I think uh, Wendy McPherson might be having some issues with her uh, connection. Uh, so I, I'd like to move on to uh, in person speaker, um, Helen Romer. Um, so, Helen, if you want to go on up, and uh, you have just as a reminder, you have three minutes to speak. Great, thank you, Jeff. Nice to see you. Thank you, Helen Wilmot. For Maywood Lane, although 400 San Mateo is what our current address is, but we have an entrance on Four Maywood Lane. I also, too, am a co signature on the letter. Um, uh, Jeff has been a long-term resident of the area, so have I, and so have other people that have co-signed on the letter. Um, Jeff owns um, four properties on Maywood Lane. I don't know if you are familiar with Maywood Lane. It's a small lane. It is a farmhouse that subdivided in the 1940s. There are 11 properties, of which Jeff owns four, and then will now own five lots on that lane. And one of the questions and concerns that we have as neighbors is uh, what is the intent for all of these different lots. We do not oppose the subdivision, not at all. In fact, um, the letter states that we are just asking for uh, the subdivision to be larger, to be consistent with the other lots on Maywood Lane. Uh, it is um, uh, sub, sub size and we have concerns as the um, uh, people want to build to the maximum size of the lot. We have concern that that lot actually will be overbuilt based on the 8,000 square feet that it is. And we'd like to see it to be the same size as other um, uh, lots of Maywood Lane. And so uh, Jeff right now, it's not his primary residence. He has moved away, but he was a very dedicated person to Maywood Lane and, and uh, purchased the other four lots. But the, all of the lots actually could be up for um, uh, current development or future development. The five Maywood Lane, uh, Jeff also owns, which does not have a, a house on it that could be developed. 10 Maywood Lane is the farmhouse, um, which don't know if it's going to get redone or developed. And eight Maywood Lane will also be developed. Um, just so you have some perspective on Maywood Lane, one Maywood Lane is a new home right now. Six Maywood Lane uh, just got sold, will likely also go, is going to be demoed and rebuilt. So in these upcoming years on a lane that has 11 properties, it looks like there's probably going to be at least four to five new constructions within about a three to four year period. So all we ask is that the um, uh, uh, commission consider the sizing, given the size of the lot that's next to it, the 40,000 square feet, and given that diagonal line, um, one of the considerations we would ask for is that you consider just to make it larger and just make it a rectangle such that a appropriate size lot and house can be on there. You'll notice that there are one, two, three, four, five um, families that have co-signed the letter. That's the entire road has um, signed a letter because Jeff owns the rest of the, uh, Mr. Huber owns the rest of the lots. So the entire neighborhood has actually come forth and just asked for your consideration. Again, uh, we do, we totally support the subdivision. That's not the issue. It's the sizing of the subdivision. And given the 40,000 square feet that's in the lot next to it, I think it's not um, unreasonable to ask that the actual subdivision not be 8,000 square feet, but be the full 10,000 square feet as is consistent with the rest of Maywood Lane. And there are um, several other neighbors that are on um, Zoom that also too would like to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to a caller if we can um, get that working. Thanks. 
Okay, hi, uh, Wendy um, McPherson, can you please try to unmute to yourself? Um, It looks like um, the caller is having a little bit of technical difficulty. Uh, do we have any other callers so we could go to first? Uh, we do not. We just have the one. Oh, here we go. Um, well, we're going to move on to Mina and Tom. Uh, Mina, if you'd like to go ahead and um, introduce yourself, your first last name, um, address and political jurisdiction in which you live, or your organization affiliation. Right. You have three minutes to speak. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Yes. <laughs> um, my name is Mina Tong. I live at 2 Maywood Lane in Menlo Park. Uh, my family has lived here in Maywood for 13 years, and we've uh, raised our two kids here. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to provide feedback. Um, just to reiterate up front what our neighbor, um, Ms. Wilmot, said, uh, we and all of our other neighbors living on Maywood Lane, who all signed the letter um, with our shared concerns, are not opposed to developing Maywood and subdividing the two lots into three in principle. Our concern is just really how the split is done. Um, I know one of my neighbors, Wendy McPherson, is planning to talk about the use of uh, net versus gross square footage and looking at the proposed eight Maywood lot. Uh, so I'll focus on the relative size of the lot compared to all of the other properties on Maywood, which we understand has implications under state law. Um, as Wendy will hopefully <laughs> be able to uh, come on and uh, discuss, the proposed usable lot space for 8 Maywood is 8,300 some square feet net or 10,000 square feet gross. Um, and uh, at this point, I'd like to bring your attention to the part of the staff report that covers the seven factors outlined by state law for planning commissions to consider for such subdivisions. Uh, in discussing how the proposal meets the third and fourth factors on type of development and density, the staff report says that uh, the proposed lots resulting from the subdivision are similar in size and character to nearby properties. Uh, however, uh, that proposed 8 Maywood Lane will not be similar in size and character to the rest of the properties on our street. Lots on Maywood range from roughly 12,200 square feet to 44,000 square feet with a median lot size of about 15,700 square feet. So at about 8,300 some square feet net or 10,000 square feet gross, the proposed size of eight Maywood Lane would be considerably smaller than every other lot on the lane and roughly half the size of the median lot. So in that regard, it doesn't seem to meet factors three and four under state law as described in the staff report. Uh, we'd like the planning commission to take these factors into account in assessing how the lots are divided. Uh, again, we're not opposed to the subdivision in principle. We just want to see the resultant lot be set up in a way that's positive for the development of Maywood and consistent with the spirit of R1S and the state law, especially since the street is undergoing what is probably a once in 50 years transition right now with multiple potential redevelopments. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. I'm looking over at Ms. Beacon to see if we can. Yes, thank you. Um, Colin, when did, did you want to try to speak again? Thanks. So it looks like uh, Wendy's microphone is still not working. Okay, are there any other callers? Um, there are no other callers. Okay. I think we need to move along. I think we've heard already from the neighbors. I think we, I think we got the gist, so I, I think that's okay. So I'd like to close public comment and move um, the, uh, back to the commission. For any questions, comments, thoughts, um, who, who would like to speak?
Yes. Commissioner Riggs. I keep looking at the top of Mr. Barnes' head, wondering if he will <laughs> look up and say, yes, I'd like to speak. And it hasn't happened yet. It's getting close to nine o'clock. Um, so um, if, if I understand the um, email and then the uh, three speakers tonight, um, or two speakers tonight, there's a concern that depending on how you name the size of this law legally or in some more practical term, there's a risk that their backyard will not be big enough. Um, it, the, the downside has not been made very clear to me. It looks as though there are going to be three lots, whatever their size may be. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that I listened and tried to find um, the concern that would override the property rights of the applicant in some way. Um, and I haven't been able to see that. And so with that, I would um, I would like to make a motion uh, to uh, approve the minor subdivision and reconfigure property lines and create three parcels for the staff report. Thank you, Commissioner Riggs. Um, would anyone else like to second the motion of Commissioner Riggs? Um, I'm Commissioner Schindler. Head of, head of that step, um, I had a, a thought that given we had a, a member of the community who was unable to speak to a point, but one of the neighbors referenced the topic uh, just for public awareness and clarification. Is there someone from staff who could just clarify the point of net versus gross, um, just so that that can be part of the record of the conversation? Uh, and, and then we can continue the conversation. Thank you, Commissioner Schindler. Uh, yes, I can clarify Please. that point. Um, so with the gross floor area, sorry, with the gross lot size, we are defining the entire property uh, as a whole. And with net, we are excluding um, any particular ingress or access type of easement. And so in this case, the portion of easement that constitutes their portion of Maywood Lane is the area that is the deduction, which results in the discrepancy between net and gross in this case. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other commissioners would like to uh, make a comment or uh, second? Uh, Commissioner Tate. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, given that there uh, was trouble um, with the uh, community being able to connect, someone else has raised their hand um, right after that person wasn't able to connect and we started moving on with, uh, with the dais. So just throwing that out there. Also, um, I, I find it interesting because it seems to me that the neighbor's concerns are um, just what Commissioner Riggs was talking about earlier with the smaller lots and, um, and then the concern about it being built out uh, later and being uh, too small to build in, or built out all the way and encroaching on the neighbors. I think that was uh, their point in this. And, um, and I, I, I'm still mulling over um, my other comments, but I just wanted to say that I, I do believe that that was issue and whether or not that's in our purview um, on this lot division is, is another story. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Tate. Um, I'm reticent to open up public comment again. Um, I'm unable to see any folks raising their hand. Do we do? Okay. All right. Why don't we reopen public comment um, and hear from the um, uh, the person who would like to speak for the public? Thanks. Okay, sure. Hi, um, Wendy. Uh, please try to uh, unmute yourself and speak. You have three minutes.
Um, it looks like Wendy is still having technical issues. Um, there's there was another person who uh, raised their hand right afterwards. So um, I'm sorry if I messed up your name. Uh, Jenna Woods, uh, you can go ahead and speak. You have three minutes. Please state your first and last name and political jurisdiction or organization you work with. You can go ahead and mute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, this is Wendy McPherson. I've switched computers here. I'm sorry. I don't know what the problem was. Um, briefly, my name is Wendy McPherson. I live at three. Can you get me paper? <laughs> I live at three Maywood Lane, and um, I just wanted to say uh, yes. I'm uh, also for the subdivision, but the issue is this is not a ten thousand. I'm going to get to the meat of it here. This is not a ten thousand square foot lot. This is an 8,362 square foot lot because this easement, everyone on Maywood Lane, you have to envision this. It's a 40 foot wide roadway. It's a private lane and we all um, uh, own to the middle of the road. That means for the width of every lot, there's a 20 foot setback that is an easement. So in other words, this lot is not a 10,000 square foot lot. It's an 8,362 square foot lot. Um, that size lot is one sixth less than a 10,000 true 10,000 square foot lot. The median size lot on Maywood Lane is 15,700 net, making the proposed lot net, which is 8,362, 45% smaller than the other Maywood Lane properties. And yes, Jeff is right, hi Jeff, um, that there are many properties in West Menlo that are 10,000 square feet. Maywood Lane does not have any 10,000 square foot properties. It, the, the smallest lot on Maywood Lane is 12,200. It was designed differently. We pay our own utilities there, utility lines. My utility line is 300 feet long out to middle. I pay for the sewer, the water and the private lane no city uh, support at all, which is fine. It was designed that way. It was also designed not to have 10,000 square foot lots. And this is not even a 10,000 square foot lot. I want him to have a 10,000 square, square foot lot. He can do the subdivision. All he needs is add less than 2,000 square feet to this lot to make it a true 10,000 square foot lot. Um, I think that's about it. He has plenty of land there, his 40,000 plus square foot lot and another 2000 added to this would make it a true 10,000 square foot lot and would again be the smallest lot on Maywood Lane. Thank you for your patience and letting me stumble through my um, audio problems. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the comment. I'm now going to again, close public comment on this item and bring it back to guys. I We have a motion on the floor from Commissioner Riggs. Um, I would love to hear from others. I myself, while I hear from the neighbors, um, I, I understand the issue. However, I don't see my way to finding um, why I would need to um, disallow this. So, for the current homeowner. So I, I I would love to hear from any other commissioners. Um, otherwise, I'm if anyone would like to um, second the motion or I see Commissioner Tate's hand up. So please. Oh, yes, I'd like to second the motion. Okay, thank you. So we have a first um, on the floor and a second. So um, without any other comments, I'd like to go ahead and go to a vote. Uh, Commissioner Barnes. Yes, thank you. Commissioner Doe? Yes. Commissioner Riggs? Yes. Commissioner Schindler? Yes. Commissioner Tate? I think you're- Sorry, right. my space bar didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, and I am also uh, a yes. So, so the motion um, passes uh, six to zero with Chair DeCarty absent. Okay, before we move on to F4, which is our next item on the agenda, I've gotten some feedback from folks that they're having trouble hearing staff, and the request is if staff, when answering, could please speak more into the microphone. Thank you. 
I'm not sure <laughs> that he heard that. Okay, so we're going to move on now to F4, uh, which is to consider and adopt a resolution determining that the abandonment of public utility easements along the rear of properties at 1701 Bay Laurel Drive and 1715 Bay Laurel Drive is consistent with the general plan and recommending that the city council approve the requested abandonment, determine the action is categorically exempt from environmental review pursuant to California Code of Regulations, Title 14, 15305, um, minor alteration in land use limitations. And just to clarify, this um, is not, we are not, this, we as the planning commission are not deciding on the abandonment. We are merely uh, deciding whether the abandonment is consistent with the general plan and recommend to the city council that they will have to um, actually uh, make the finding for the abandonment. Are there any other um, additions to the staff report on this item? I, I'm not sure who has this item. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, my name is Idris Rangin. I'm one of the associate engineers for the city of Mama Park. Uh, as oh, you mentioned, you. the staff report is complete and I do not have additional information to add to it. However, I will be available for any questions. Thank you. Terrific. Um, I think before we go to public comment, are there any clarifying questions for staff regarding this? Okay. Um, I would like to open it up for public comment on this application. Ms. Began, do we have any hands raised from the public? Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Harris. Um, at this moment, there are no comments or questions, but we can give it a minute to see if any come in. Okay. I think if I'm going to close public comment and bring it back to the commission for any questions or comments or a motion. Um, does anyone from the commission want to make a comment or a motion at this time? Uh, Commissioner Tate. Um, yes, I make a motion to, to uh, make the recommendation. I think that's what we need to do, right? Yeah, motion finding that the abandonment is consistent with the general plan so that it can be moved to the city council. Yes, let's do that. Okay, do we have a second um, for Commissioner Tate's motion? Okay, I've got a second from uh, Commissioner Doe. Let's take a vote. Uh, Commissioner Barnes, you're muted. Thank you, yes. <laughs> okay, um, Commissioner Doe. Yes. Commissioner Riggs. Yes. Commissioner Schindler. Yes. Commissioner Tate. Yes. And I'm also a yes, so the motion passes with 640 against. Um, thank you so much, um, Mr. Rangin. And uh, we will move on to the next item. But before we do that, um, I think the next item is going to be a larger uh, discussion. So I think it might behoove us to take uh, a five minute break right now. Uh, so I would like to adjourn and come back in five minutes. Thank you.
Okay, hello everyone. Um, welcome back to the continuation of um, the January 9th, 2023, the first uh, Planning Commission of the year. We are now on F5, which we're gonna be discussing about the SB9. Uh, it is to consider and adopt a resolution to make a recommendation to City Council on amendments to Title 16 zoning to add Chapter 16.77 to unit housing developments and amend Chapter 16.79 accessory dwelling units and amendments to Title 15 subdivisions to add Chapter 15.31 urban lot splits in order to make city regulations consistent with applicable California law regarding urban lot splits and two unit developments on properties in single family residential zoning districts. I understand that we have a staff report and I am sure it will explain to the public some of the items that I just read for clarity. So I think Mr. Turner has a staff report for us on this item. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Harris. Um, I don't have anything to add to the staff report, but I do have uh, a presentation on the ordinance tonight. Yes. Um, I will try to make it as brief as possible. Um, a lot of it is a recap from, from the study session in um, July. And on his going to, to the front. Um, but then once uh, once I get this presentation, I'm happy to take any questions um, and then drop a comment on, on the item. Okay, thank you, Vaughn. Um, and I'll just ask you to go to the next slide um, so I can have my notes up. So welcome to the, um, the hearing on the proposed SB9 ordinance tonight. Uh, we will introduce the ordinance itself, um, go through some of the proposed regulations, and ultimately look for a recommendation from the Planning Commission to the City Council. Next slide, please. Um, our agenda for tonight will be a quick recap of some of the general information and state mandates um, for SB9, some of the recommended ordinance uh, standards, and then um, we'll show a few uh, example developments that we have. I do have our consulting architect, Arnold Mamarella, on the line with us uh, for any architectural questions. Um, and then Mary Wagner from our city attorney's office. Uh, should legal questions arise? Next slide, please. So very quickly, some general not, uh, general SB9 information. Uh, next slide, please. The intent of SB9 is to help alleviate statewide housing crisis um, to provide another strategy for producing housing units um, and ultimately to provide additional home ownership opportunities in single family neighborhoods. Next slide. Um, SB9 went into effect January 1 of last year, so it's been in effect for um, a year, and it affects all single family zoned parcels in the, in the city. Uh, with limited exceptions um, for parcels, mostly within certain hazard zones. Uh, next slide, please. So SB9 establishes some basic requirements. Um, it requires ministerial approval of subdivision of single family lots, what we call an urban lot split. Um, and then the construction of up to two units, um, ministerial meaning no planning commission review, no use permit, um, goes straight to the building permit. Um, SB9 establishes minimum lot size of 1,200 square feet and certain requirements on the proportion um, of each lot to the, to the original lot for a 60-40 split. Um, limits the city to only being able to require up to one parking space per unit um, with some exceptions um, for proximity to, to transit and car fares. 
and then um, in the in the event of a lot split, um, owners must live on the property for a minimum of three years. Next slide, please. Um, so cities are allowed to implement their own objective standards uh, as long as they do not include the development of, of two units of at least 800 square feet. Um, so we had the study session in July. We took that input um, from the study session and, and tried to refine as best we could um, the standards to address some of the comments. Um, so I'm going to go through the recommended um, development standards pretty quickly. Um, a, a lot of them are very similar, if not the same, from the study session. Um, so I'll try to highlight what has changed between then and now. Uh, next slide, please. So for floor area build, uh, limit and building coverage, these standards have not changed from the study session. Um, generally, there, there was support for, um, for these standards, so they haven't changed. Um, we would establish a floor area ratio of 0.56 on uh, lots 5,000, less than 5,000 square feet. Um, with a minimum of 1,600 to get those to 800 square foot units. Uh, one story building coverage would be FAL plus 200 square feet, and then two story building coverage would be 1,000 square feet or 30% of the lot, whichever is greater. Next slide, please. Uh, the maximum unit size is something we also proposed at the study session. Um, it also hasn't changed. So um, there would be a maximum unit size of, of the max FAL minus 800 square feet for uh, properties with less than 2,000 square feet of the available floor area um, or a max of 60% of the available floor area uh, for lots with, with a floor area limit of 2,000 square feet or greater. Um, what has changed in this iteration is originally we proposed um, a caveat that stated applicants could apply for a use permit to consolidate the floor area into all of the floor, available floor area into a single unit, uh, essentially max out in one unit um, through the use permit process. Um, we have removed that uh, allowance, so uh, applicants would not be able to ask for a use permit to build one um, large unit. Um, staff believes this meets the spirit of SB9 uh, by requiring applicants to build smaller, uh, potentially more affordable units rather than one um, large unit that may not be as affordable. Uh, next slide, please. Um, for setbacks and step backs, again, these uh, haven't changed. There's a four foot um, side and rear ground floor setback that's state mandated. Um, the front setback would be the underlying zoning district, which is 20 feet in most cases uh, for single family properties. Um, we would allow zero lot line, um, which is where you build two seemingly connected structures. that are um, separated by firewalls and are structurally attached, um, but there's essentially no uh, setback in that case. Um, Stepbacks would be required uh, on the second story, which would be um, the underlying, the setback of the underlying zoning district. Uh, so for example, 20 feet in the rear or on an R1S lot, 10 feet on the sides. Um, one item that we um, added in this round, we, we figured uh, we didn't analyze what happens on corner lots that are split along the corner sides of the longer edge. Um, in that case, we did some analysis um, and had to come up with special setbacks for, for those lots. Um, by creating a new front setback, if you um, apply the, the front setback of 20 feet and then a second story setback in the rear of 20 feet, um, it's virtually impossible to get um, 1,600 square feet of floor area in that case. Um, 
So for corner lots uh, that are split along that longer edge, um, we have a 12 foot front setback, which is consistent with the existing um, corner side setback in, in most single family districts. Um, the four feet on the rear and sides, which would be state mandated setbacks, and then 10 foot rear um, second story setback. Uh, next slide. Um, so one of the biggest changes uh, we we made was for parking and um, and the frontage uh, improvements. Um, we maintained the one uh, uncovered space per unit um, for state law. Uh, we've maintained that parking can be allowed in the front setback. Um, however, we've added the caveat that only one of the required parking spaces can be located in the front setback. Uh, the second space would need to be outside of the front setback um, to accommodate that parking situation. Um, we now uh, would allow tandem parking. So having one parking space behind um, the other to allow that second space to be outside of the front setback. Um, and then one of the biggest concerns we heard was the amount of paving, uh, potentially the amount of paving um, on a 50 foot original lot width uh, to accommodate parking. Um, so we've now, added a maximum of 40% of the front yard um, can be paved for, for driveways and parking, um, and then added a minimum 50% landscape uh, requirement um, with some allowances for things like um, paved walkways. Um, and then we put a maximum of 20 linear feet, um, a maximum of 20 linear feet of driveway, uh, regardless of, of your lot width. Um, next slide, please. So what that does, um, these are the original, this is the original example on the left um, that, that caused some concern for the parking uh, pavement. So on the right is the result of the change and how that would affect that, that front setback area. Um, each property would have its two parking spaces um, in tandem with each other. Uh, the second space would be outside of the front setback, and then that front yard um, would need to be uh, landscaped appropriately. Next slide, please. Um, this is a map of the properties that would be exempt from providing uh, required parking in green. Um, this is within a half mile of a, of a high quality transit corridor. Um, the properties in yellow, um, if there were ever to be improvements of a service along Willow Road, um, those could potentially be exempt in the future. Um, and it includes a lot of Bellhaven and the Willows neighborhood. Um, so although a, a lot of properties either are or may be exempt from requiring parking, um, staff believe that we needed to have these uh, maximum parking uh, pavement requirements and minimum um, landscape requirements, because although they may not be required to provide parking, uh, given that there's a prohibition on overnight street parking, um, it's likely that the applicants would provide those spaces anyway. Uh, next slide. Yeah. Uh, so building massing, this um, hasn't changed too much. We would keep the maximum 28-foot height limit, which is consistent with existing um, the existing height limit on most single-family properties. Uh, what we changed was originally we proposed a daylight plane of 12 feet, uh, the daylight plane to be measured at 12 feet, 6 inches. Um, we've raised that to 14 feet just to give a little bit more flexibility in um, the design of second stories. Um, also, if, if you create a situation where you have to 
um, use some of the building buildable area for parking, you need to shift some of the floor area potentially to the to the second floor. Um, so we propose 14 feet. We think this is appropriate. Um, it's still um, more restrictive than um, the daylight plan on most um, R1U properties. Um, it still requires that um, most developments would need to step back further than the minimum second story setback uh, to be able to fit within the daylight plane. Um, and it's, um, we feel like it's a good compromise uh, between single family and then the, the ADU daylight plans where um, there essentially is no daylight plane requirement up to 16 feet. Next slide, please. There we go. Um, so for privacy and architectural design, um, we removed the requirements for higher quality window materials. Um, the planning commission had some concerns about raising the cost of these developments. So we've taken those, um, we've taken those requirements out, uh, but we maintained other privacy-based um, standards, such as the minimum three feet uh, second story cell height or five feet in, um, in stairwells or, or use obscure glass, then um, we maintain the smooth stucco and the simulated true divide of light requirement um, because that would likely not uh, increase the cost significantly. Next slide. Um, so the next few slides I'll go through very quickly and we can return to them if we have uh, questions, but just to give a, um, a few examples. Next slide. Um, so this is go back. There we go. Um, this is that sort of standard fifty by hundred lot we saw um, earlier with the adjusted uh, parking requirements. Um, the uh, footprint doesn't really change very much from what was previously um, shown in the study session, um, but it does uh, create a better frontage experience um, from the landscaping um, requirements. Next slide, please. Uh, go back. So this is uh, one of those corner lot scenarios um, that was not previously looked at at the, the study session. Um, in this case, you can see the lot is split um, horizontally along the, the street side. Um, so you create that new front along the street side. Um, so more of a townhome development would likely um, be the most probable here. Um, parking spaces would have to be adjusted slightly, but the, the footprint is, is what we were trying to get across here. Next slide. Um, this is similar to, um, to the pan handle uh, that was shown at the study session. Um, we did need to revise the, the width of the pan handle um, to comply with fire uh, code and then um, and, and the subdivision uh, codes. So the pan handle would need to be 20 feet. Um, driveway itself would only need to be um, 10 feet in this case. So you have more um, area for, for landscaping. Next slide, please. Um, so this one is just another example. It's a, it's a shared driveway in uh, this case. So again, the, the pan handle itself would be 20 feet. Um, the drive, new driveway would be, um, need to be a minimum of 16 feet uh, to allow access to um, the parking for all four units. Um, but this allows for a variety of design and location of the units on the lot. 
next slide. Uh, the next two are um, haven't changed at all from the from the study session. Um, these have already been seen. These are larger lots, which is generally easier to design around. Um, but this one uh, was split down the middle, has a variety of unit sizes on each of the lot, uh, each of the lots, so uh, it can provide different opportunities based on needs of um, occupants. And then the final, I believe the final slide, yes, this is the, uh, the parking court example. Um, in this case, the, the width of the driver would have to uh, increase a little bit. I think this was 10 feet, it would have to go to 16 feet. Um, that shouldn't uh, affect the, the footprint or the design of the houses in this example. Um, I believe that is the end. I'm happy to take any questions uh, on these. We can come back to any of the examples uh, if we need to. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, before I, we, we want to go to public comment, but before we do that, are there any clarifying questions to staff from any of the commissioners? Commissioner Riggs. Yes, thank you. Uh, through the chair to staff. Yes. <laughs> Maybe I'll just cover it. Um, so uh, my question would be, I'm sure where the speaker is that's doing this. Um, have we in any way investigated the size of the parking space? And uh, would we consider reducing the size of the parking space? So the size of the parking space um, that was determined by um, city council adopted um, standards through the transportation division um, for uncovered uncovered spaces are smaller than um, spaces required in in garages. So the typical covered space is ten by twenty feet. Um, uncovered spaces are eight and a half by sixteen and a half feet. Um, unless it's next to a wall or other physical barrier, um, then the width needs to increase to nine and a half feet. Um, so it is smaller than a, a standard garage space. Um, I think if we vis visit any like, smaller, it would need to um, be an, a new adopted standard by the city council uh, with a recommendation from the transportation division. Um, I was going to reference those sizes, uh, but our sample diagram showed 10 by 20. So um, that's that's the perfect answer. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Riggs. Are there any other clarifying questions from the commission before we go to public comment? Uh, Commissioner Schindler. Uh, Thank you, Vice Chair Harris. I, I think this is a clarifying question or more a, a context question. Um, I have been sort of, since, since I was not part of the July conversation, wanting to put this, this broader evaluation into the context of Menlo Park's housing strategy and specifically our goals to expand, expand housing um, inventory and affordable housing inventory. Um, so when I think about this relative to one of the other things that are part of the housing element and a number of the other proposals that are out there, um, I was seeking to put it in context. There is a study that the, um, the Turner Center at Berkeley put out, um, and I suspect the staff is familiar with this, uh, and I was looking to understand, trying to be a little more succinct here, roughly the order of magnitude of adoption we think we might see in Menlo Park. Um, and so for, for specifically around the things we're discussing tonight for SB, for SB9, um, this particular report has a fairly complicated methodology, um, but it roughly says that um, the number of parcels that would incrementally be developed um, absent compared to a world without SB9 
um, is small, sort of depending on the range of, of where you're talking about in the state. My understanding is that it's somewhere between one and a half percent and three percent. And the study, um, while it uses the same methodology as I understand that in all the areas of the state, does break it out by county. And it said both for San Mateo and for Santa Clara, the number was around 1.3 percent. So not asking for accurate forecasts, not asking anybody to look into a crystal ball, but does, does staff have any reason to assume that the adoption in Menlo Park would be significantly different, like an order of magnitude different from those kind of numbers? So if, so my, my again, my back of the envelope was, let's say there are 7,000 single family parcels in Menlo Park, 1% is 70 of those. Does, does staff believe that that is significantly off base as an assumption when I'm trying to put this in context? Right, that's a, that's a good question. Um, like you said, we, we don't have a crystal ball. Um, so it is a little bit tough to say as, as far as the broader context um, in the context of the housing element, SB9 is, um, you know, just another option to provide housing. It's not supposed to be, or it's not um, likely to be the, the bulk of the housing increase um, from the um, housing element strategies. Um, anecdotally, we are starting to get more questions about it. Um, it was sort of seen a similar trajectory potentially as we did with uh, ADUs. Um, there was a, a slate of new um, ADU laws that went into effect in 2020. It was a bit slow. Uh, but once architects and, and developers started to understand the regulations a little bit better, we, we did see, we have continued to see sort of an explosion of um, development of ADUs. So potentially um, we could see that here with SB9, but um, given that units would need to be owner-occupied, it, it puts a little different constraint um, on development of SB9 units and SB lot, SB9 lot splits in particular um, that ADUs don't have, so developers can't come in and just redevelop and, and sell, uh, split the lots, uh, which they can do with, with ADUs. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. It's, it is a little bit difficult to, to say um, with certainty how popular of an option this this will be and how widespread um, in our in our single family districts or if it'll be significantly different than the findings of the, the Turner um, report. Okay. Thank thank you for weighing in. I understand sort of the difficult the difficulty in, in forecasting and prognosticating and you know weighing in on the, the validity of whether that study actually makes sense for all of us. Um, but it was it was particularly interesting for me. Um, I'll, I'll hold my next question, Vice Chair Harris, till everybody else, other other folks have had a chance. Um, well, so are there any other clarifying questions before we go? To okay, so Ms. Began, let's open up public comment and see if we have some commenters who would like to speak on this item. Thank you, Vice Chair Harris. Uh, I will now introduce Jenny Mitchell. Um, Jenny, as a reminder, you have three minutes to share your comment or question. Please clearly state your first and last name, address, local jurisdiction in which you live, or organizational affiliation. You can go ahead and unmute yourself now. Uh, thank you. Dear Chair, Vice Chair, Commissioners, staff, neighbors, and members of the public, I'm Jenny Michelle from the Coleman Place Neighborhood Block, a recovering homeless teacher by trade, a commercial property manager representing landlord interests and a former luxury real estate agent in Menlo Park. Item F5, happy new year. I support and applaud the city for taking this step. Yeah, you rock and inspire. But what if any actual SB9 projects are in the pipeline as just mentioned? These mysterious two to four unit projects are forecasted to go where exactly? Definitely not district one, correct? That moratorium listed is where precisely? 
I'm curious, is it not within this diocese scope to send a letter to each local broker who transacts real estate in our municipality to ascertain certain several pieces of information from them, as well as share the steps the city is taking to be mandate compliant? Question mark. One, SB9 urban lot split market force with homeowners starts with real estate brokerages. What local real estate brokerage has a pro SB9 campaign? If it exists, it has eluded me. So I'm suspect that brokerages have not beefed up on these resources and programs. Two, we see trendy campaigns for diversity, but not the actual campaign to implement fair housing. What outreach program is the city using to directly drive up market force for SB9 projects? Why three, why isn't each item on your agenda a request to split the lot and get more people stabilized in our neighborhoods? I wonder what drives this. Why isn't each applicant testing the new laws? I can rent out the parking space to a worker who lives out of their mobile home, right? With the city grant for that type of use. Four, most importantly, our assumptions for required residential use is off. If I was single, 300,000 square, or sorry, 300, 300 square feet would be enough for me to live without a car, just my bike. Where in the city do we have zoned use for someone like me? You mandate that I must live in a large space, but that isn't my need. What is the city doing for someone like me? So when I hear R1S and RES, 10,000 and 12,000 square foot relative, that's a massive, oh, sorry, my time's done. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Michelle, for your comment. Uh, do we have any other commenters? I think, yes, uh, we have Nisha Sillin. Uh, Nisha, just as a reminder, you have three minutes to speak. And um, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Good evening, uh, members of the Planning Commission. Thank you for taking my comment. My name is Misha. I live in the Allied Arts neighborhood of Menlo Park, um, where we have a lot of R2 lots, uh, where there are two homes on the same lot that typically share a driveway, but they're detached one behind the other. Um, looking around even our area, it's pretty unique. Uh, so I think when SB9 was written, it was imagining, you know, lot splits or maybe uh, attached duplexes, but we do in Menlo Park have this other model where um, we have homeowners buying homes that share a lot and a driveway. And I think SB9 could enable more projects like that in Menlo Park. Um, so my comment is just that we already have homes sort of similar to an SB9 model that exists in Menlo Park. It's not this scary new thing. It's kind of just expanding where it can go. So we should incentivize um, people to take advantage of these rules. Um, and so to the other commenter's point and to other comments made before, we haven't yet seen any sort of large influx of, pro of applications is my understanding. Um, and so we shouldn't be creating any rules that make it any harder to build two homes on one lot rather than one. It should be the opposite. Um, we want to see more housing. Um, this type of housing could lead to more home ownership if, if we wanna make it so. So we should make it so that if someone is buying a home, let's say in Allied Arts, uh, for over $2 million, we're seeing this and tearing it down. They're not just going to build one giant house with a basement. Um, like on Bay Laurel, we're seeing a lot of those projects finishing up right now. We want to make sure they want to build two homes um, or maybe even split the law and do four homes. And so they should have maybe more uh, building coverage, more area coverage, uh, lower fees. So instead of charging fees per unit, 
Um, we should make sure we're charging fees per square foot. Maybe there's a discount based on density. Um, we want to make sure that the daylight plane requirements are not more restrictive um, than a single family home. That doesn't make any sense. And um, we should make sure that whoever is building these homes can easily subdivide them into condos, as is the case in Menlo Park on R2 lots, so that each home can be sold uh, to a homeowner. So th those are the things that I would like to see in the rules. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Do we have additional commenters? Uh, thank you, Vice Chair. There's, at this moment, we do not have any more comments or questions. Yeah, let's give it one more minute. Any more hands raised? I can confirm, I can, I'm sorry, I can confirm that there are no public comments that have been submitted. Okay, I'm going to close public comment at this time and bring it back to the commission for questions and comments um, on the staff report. Who would like to start us off? Commissioner Barnes. Thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to, to speak this evening. I'd like to open my comments by saying that I really appreciate the depth of work that staff put into this, and I'm appreciative of some of the adaptations that they made to some of the examples that they put forward. And if it's permissible, uh, I'd like to ask staff to put up the side-by-side um, -side comparison that they had uh, earlier showing what was attachment, uh, excuse me, example 1A, the before and the after, because I want to point out some of the things that I think uh, were thoughtful and really worked about that. So if someone could pull that up, I'd be appreciative. Yes, thank you. To the extent you could enlarge it. Thank you very much. Um, here's what I think really works about that. And I think um, the thoughtfulness of it needs to go uh, noticed. The orientation of the front uh, entrance, the doors, um, I think is thoughtful. The obviously the inclusion of the yard. And I'm appreciative of the. Uh, minimum landscaping requirements on there. Um, I think the tandem parking works and works well. Um, shifted to the side. Um, I believe that the, you know, the set, the, the ground floor setbacks and then the layering on top of that, the step backs of the second floor relative to what that zoning district has, I think talks to privacy concerns of neighbors. And I think that works uh, as well. And I'm appreciative of that. Um, I think the privacy of individuals walking from units one and two to units, uh, excuse me, yeah, one uh, in back are units two and four and the ability to access them from the tandem parking and walk along the side, um, I think works really well as well. So I'm appreciative of that. Uh, I have a question as it relates to the diagram, uh, the revised 1A. And it's difficult because I can't show it on my cursor, but I'm curious, outside of uh, unit one and unit three, the um the outline of uh, I, I i assume it's fencing but in the in the uh, rear of one and three into the setback is that intended to um indicate fencing that is on the the left and the right in the rear of one and three along the setback 
Um, yeah, those were little like patio areas, um, just other outdoor private open, semi-private open space for the units. Got it. And then from a from a spacing perspective, uh, I think I mean given what we have here and given the the minimum requirements for parking. Um, so say there were two of these 1A lots, one right next to each other. Um, th there's, is it correct to say that there's not an opportunity for even a small median between, this would be parcel, you know, one parcel that has four units on it. And then the next parcel, say there was one to its immediate right, we'd be out of space to be able to have any type of um, medium between the two for any type of uh, landscaping. Is that correct? Um, there could be an opportunity for a median. Um, you could shift the, um, the driveway a little bit closer to the um, to the unit three, let's say we're taking the right side, you can shift the driveway to unit three um, and kind of just flip flop where that landscaping strip is. Um, if you do that on, on both sides, um, you end up with a couple foot, I guess, median between driveways. Oh, thank you. Um, and then these, these are for illustrative purposes only. There's no um, would you, would staff be in a position to provide uh, any type of um, examples of development on these parcels in the context of SB9, which would, for instance, show what you have here? Or how would a potential developer get an idea for, uh, this is what we have. We've got a 5,000 square foot lot. This is Menlo Park. This is, you know, this is what has been run up and down the flagpole in terms of um, a desired uh, site plan. How would that get communicated to a potential developer? Um, just to clarify, you're asking if what essentially what are the resources um, to get their hands on sort of an example. Sure. Question? How would they know that this this site plan that you've created, which has uh, been the byproduct of a lot of uh, work and thoughtfulness, how would they have exposure to this? Um, so the staff report and these exhibits um, are, are um, obviously public record, um, so they'd be able to see these. Um, once we implement the, the ordinance, um, should, should it be passed by, by city council, um, we would do some work, um, likely update our, our website. Um, right now we have an SB9 webpage. Um, it has our interim guidelines right now. We would update that with, um, with the adopted standards. Um, and then we could, Definitely link uh, potentially these examples, um, but yeah, they they are illustrative. Uh, only they they show a possible um, development, not really a mandated um, design, um, but they would be available. They are available publicly. Uh, we would try to make them more accessible via the website. Got it. And let me ask you this. In a scenario where someone wanted to build the envelope out to the edge of the setback, for instance, for unit one and three, um, if I'm understanding this correctly, what would happen to the tandem parking scenario? How would they, what would be the other potential configurations for parking? Um, in this particular case, um, it might might not be possible. It, it would just be something they have to provide and design around if, if they are required to um, provide the two parking spaces. Um, there's obviously not a, a requirement to, to split the lot. Um, 
So if you didn't have the lot split and you only built two units, you had a lot more area to to fit the parking um, in a tanning configuration. Um, but it, it is fairly difficult on these smaller 50 by 100 lots um, to, to design around when, when you need to put both the, the parking spaces on each lot. Uh, thank you. Um, and then going, I'm going to bounce around a little bit, coming off of some of the design questions into um, in referencing the slides, Mr. Turner, that you opened up the uh, your presentation with, one was advocating for the potential of SB9 to impact home ownership. And then there's another piece in there about uh, meeting and advancing the goals of, of the housing element. And within that, uh, you know, it's a deeper affordabilities and um, addressing units that, you know, providing units for folks with lower AMI. So let me start on the top here. Um, what is staff's, has staff contemplated how this uh, initiative uh, within Menlo Park in addressing SB9 uh, can be tailored to advance home ownership opportunities? Has there been any, what was your thinking on that? And I know that we left that the last meeting wondering how um, any mechanisms or levers that could be used. Do you have thoughts on that? And has staff given that thought? And what does that look like? Right. So, so the, the statute of SB9 um, says we, you know, they put some of those minimum development standards out there. Um, says the city and implement its own development standards as long as it doesn't include the two units at 800 square feet. Um, and also, uh, so the, the units um, are uh, suitable for separate conveyance. Basically, they can be sold separately. Um, so there's a couple of ways to go about this. Uh, the urban lot split itself, um, that obviously creates two new lots um, that can be sold separately. Um, we did talk about the um, ability to do a condo subdivision um, separately from SB9. It's not covered under the urban lot split visions, um, but one of the public commenters mentioned um, developments on like Partridge and, and Cambridge and the R2 and R3 districts um, that have these two unit developments. Um, those are condo subdivisions. Uh, we see them all the time. Uh, we could allow for units created by SB9 um, to be able to be condo subdivided. So that would go from <coughs> from one unit, essentially from a single family home, being able to be sold to, to four if uh, fully built out um, for separate home ownership opportunities. And, and what additional, what additional work needs to be done about that? What's the, is there a mechanism or are there processes or procedures that additionally um, need to be adopted in order to facilitate that um, condo subdivision mechanism for as it relates to this uh, SB9. Um, we would likely have to include other amendments in the subdivision ordinance. Um, so right now, uh, all SB9 covers is the urban lot split. So the split between um, of the single family lot and two separate lots. Um, the condo subdivision um, provisions are a different chapter subdivision ordinance. Um, and they basically say that um, the subdivision has to, the condo subdivision has to go to the planning commission for approval, um, or it can be um, 
approved administratively through public works if it's um, if like a use permit is approved um, for development of the, the two units um, it's kind of concurrently with a, a, an approval for a condo subdivision so um, we would essentially have to write into subdivision ordinance that SB9 projects from SB9 development could be like administratively um, approved so they didn't have to come to the planning commission. So that would be the appropriate mechanism to facilitate that. And I'll talk to that for a moment. We, we threw the housing element in the the, the densification, um, the, the process that we're going through are creating units throughout the city. Uh, those units will be occupied by renters. There's not, um, and this is, this is um, me not specifically talking to you, Mr. Turner, but just saying in general, the thesis for, for why I'm suggesting this uh, to the wider audience. You know, when, when these developments that are being contemplated under the housing element and the densification are coming um, to fruition, they are by commercial developers and they're large and, and certainly when they're larger projects, they're rolled up into larger real estate entities and they're they're not for um, home, they're not for ownership. Um, a number of things preclude that, uh, including some of the, the tail liabilities associated with the condo development. Um, so this is this is one of the few opportunities we have in our city to really facilitate um, ownership opportunities, uh, whereas in other developments they're simply owned by entities that have no interest in in doing condos. They're they're in the business of building multifamily housing for the purpose of renting that. Um, so this is an opportunity to do that. You know the scale of which we'll see. You know how effective SB nine is. Uh, but I'll come back to this later. And I think this, the ability to ministerially approve uh, condo maps on these SB9 projects, I think is a fairly um, not heavy lift and not from a policy perspective, uh, you know, super problematic. So I, 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 um, advocate for that and then I'll come back to that for the reasons I just stated about the opportunity to get condos here that you don't have somewhere else, home ownership opportunities. The other uh, piece, Mr. Turner, if, through the chair, if it's permissible, um, the discussion that was had at our last meeting as it relates to uh, having uh, affordability requirements or covenants um, on the units that are generated through SB9, the thesis being, you know, in return for upzoning these parcels, having a unique opportunity to get um, some deeper affordabilities uh, in these, and that in a turn that in turn can be tied to homeownership, which is a little bit tougher, or into you know the rental piece of it. Where did that land, and did that? Um, was there any discussion with staff? Because I don't see it anywhere. I see it referenced as a something that came up at the last meeting, but I don't see anything in the staff report related to that. So if you could enlighten me a little bit on what if any further discussions were had about that. Uh, yeah, so we, we touched on this at the study session. Um, acquiring BMR units is a, is a tough um, it's a tough thing on, on these SB9 projects. Um, it's basically from at a state level, um, once you hit an affordability of proportion of units um, of 10% uh, of affordability for um, 20 units or less, or 15% um, for more than 20 units, um, it's it's deemed to be financially burdensome um, and would actually be a, a hindrance to the production of um, BMR units. So in order for the city to acquire um, a, a BMR 
ratio above 15%. So if you have a four unit development, 25%, um, there has to be a very conclusive um, study that it wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't hinder the, the development of PMR units. Um, we have not had a chance to do that. It'd be a, a fairly extensive uh, research um, project and would most likely need to come from direction uh, from city council. But it would be fairly difficult, I believe. Got it. And that, that, that makes sense. I mean, ostensibly, if you're having the person in 1A pay for their, you know, augment their rent for the person in 1B, having scale to do that across um, reduces, you know, makes it more economically feasible to do that. So um, point well taken, understood. Thank you for that clarification. Um, give me a moment here, uh, to the chair, give me a moment here where I look through some of my notes. Okay, that uh, for now, that is it. And I will leave with the strong desire to um, add the ministerial, if I'm understanding this correctly, the ability to do ministerial approvals of condo subdivisions on SB9 projects. We'll come back to that. Thank you for now. Thank you, Commissioner Barnes. Are there others who would like to speak on this issue? Commissioner Dodo. Thank you, Vice Chair Harris. Um, again, I also appreciate the detailed work that staff did to respond to the commission's and community concerns. Um, specifically, um, there were some concerns of being overly restrict restrictive, so I appreciate some of those changes, such as removing a minimum lot width and um, and then also the, the design changes with um, imagining the possibility of the, the, the parking. Um, I, I did have a question about the rear setback. Um, I understand that this is a question to, to, to staff, um, that typically a single family home has a first floor 20 foot setback, and then the second floor does not need to step back, um, and then with the SB9 projects, um, the SB9 requirement is that the first floor has a rear four foot setback, but the second floor would have the um, underlying underlying zone, second story step back of 20 feet. <laughs> and so I'm just, it's a question of proportion. Those are very um, different dimensional proportions. And so I just would, um, I'm just curious as to your thoughts in terms of um, design possibilities and proportions there. That seems like just a large um, dimension. Um, I just wonder if you could speak to that. Um, yeah, so so the step back requirement was um, mostly a, a privacy, um, mostly to address privacy. Um, going from a, a 20 foot setback to a four foot setback um, on the second floor is pretty, um, it's a pretty big change for particularly for uh, residents to the rear. Um, there are ways, you know, you would have to do some, some creative engineering uh, to make it work. Um, as far as design potential, I may want to, um, I may want to defer to our consulting architect, uh, Arnold Mamarella. Um, he may have a better answer as to how that design works. Uh, and not to, not to um, cut you off, Mr. Mamarella, I just wanted to clarify, I understand that you would want privacy. I, I wouldn't advocate for no step back um, in that situation, but maybe uh, maybe a more nuanced, if, 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 but not, not 
but not for obliterating the step back altogether. I understand the need for privacy with the um, decrease for your step back, set back. Sure. Um, I'll try to respond to a, a couple of the points. Thank you for asking. Uh, the um, uh, four foot first floor setback to the 20 foot second floor for most situations would be 16 feet difference, which is about the, the, the depth of a room, like a family room on the first floor. So it might fit pretty well within a structural model module. Uh, the other thing is we did consider um, places where the 20 foot setback would not apply. One is in the corner lot uh, sub subdivision example where the, it would be only 10 foot because of the constraints of that lot. And then secondly, where you have a subdivision, um, sort of a newly created property line, in those cases, there would not be uh, the 20 foot setback between say a front lot and a rear lot in, in a panhandle lot situation. So it was mainly just to protect uh, existing property to the rear, which in most cases, um, would have less in, impact with a deeper setback. Um, thank you. Um, I, my next question is about parking. Um, let's see. So if I understand correctly, SB9 says no more than one required parking space unless it's within half mile walking distance of a high quality transit corridor. And I believe that the, what the city, what staff is proposing is the minimum of one parking space per unit. A requ required minimum of one parking space per unit? Correct. Um, and so I in the staff report, do you um, acknowledge that um, commissioners brought up the idea of um, no parking requirements in the staff report? You definitely mentioned that you considered it, but given the fact that overnight parking is prohibited, owners would probably provide one space per unit anyway. Um, completely follow that logic. And I just I'm, just, I'm just wondering if it's different to anticipate that which is I feel like what you've done with some of the design guidelines about landscaping and, and um, regulating too much paving. Um, wonder, I wonder if it's different to anticipate that versus mandating that. Um, it's just a, an open-ended question whether or not to just keep it as a maximum rather than a required minimum. So, who's that? <laughs> question. That's a good question. Um, and I think we have to, to look at it two ways. So um, the, the one space per unit is what the state says the city can mandate. Um, so we can't require like right now for single family homes, it's two spaces per unit, we can't do that. Um, so that's one thing, and we can certainly say, you know, there are no required parking spaces, that is an option, um, but you still would have to have requirements in, in place to protect the, the paving and the frontage. Um, they're, they're two separate issues. Um, and we, we could say, you know, no required parking anywhere for SB9 um, projects, regardless of their distance from, um, from transit, but without those uh, maximum paving and minimum landscape, it's likely we would still see the parking. Um, unless the more radical approach would say, you know, you can't provide parking. Um, which that we didn't really study that, that we didn't think it would be very practical um, given that the overnight on street parking prohibition, um, it would be very difficult. You would, it would limit the market essentially um, who could live there um, if you don't have any parking um, available to, to residents. So you, 
Does that answer the question? It does. And, and, and thank you for even bringing up the more radical. I don't think that I was ready yet to even <laughs> prohibit providing parking. I was just wondering if maybe if you wanted to keep some of those design guidelines about landscaping and paving, let's say you kept that, but not also require parking. Because I see what you're saying, that if you remove all of that, then you may just end up with four parking spaces out front, which is what um, the commission had objected against. Um, yeah, I mean, it's certainly a, a, a recommendation um, you could make to the, to the city council if that's um, the direction you'd want to choose for, to, to make that up the one space and parking maximum rather than a minimum. Well, I would be interested in hearing others' perspective on that, of course, so I'll just leave it um, to leave it at that. Um, let's see, I had her questions at the moment. Um, Actually, I just have a few comments on the diagrams um, in the staff report, page F4, example 2B. Um, I, I, I know that these are just um, starting points and not exhaustive and not prescriptive. Um, I would just say that this one starts to devote a lot of the lot to driveway and parking spaces. Um, and I would like to bring back one of the examples from the previous July 25th packet. Um, and you actually showed in the presentation, uh, I haven't seen the staff report, but the um, bungalow court, um, I remember actually Commissioner Riggs made a comment about this. Um, and, I, and it's actually much like many of the units on my street. And I just wonder if you, if um, if that modification to parking were done that was similar to one A, where the parking is maybe tucked in the corners and the courtyard becomes courtyard, not parking access courtyard. But anyway, those are details. I would just like to say I like I appreciated the communal um, spirit of that scheme, and it was nice to see it in the presentation. Um, and then I missed it in the staff report this time around. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Doe. Are there other commissioners that would like to speak? Provide comments. Yes. Commissioner Riggs. Um, so this. Uh... This effort has moved along you know, awfully nicely, um, given that we were put in a position by the state. And I think this response is um, very sensitive. And I particularly want to thank Mr. Memorella for his work, um, wonderfully illustrating some options for all of us, I think, to better understand what we're looking at uh, and are talking about. Um, you know, I, I think I'm just going to skip over a, a couple of comments that I just don't think are, are that critical. I, I think I really have just one concern, and it's an overriding concern, and that is that I believe we need at least some level of design guidelines. Um, this has been a sticky point, um, but if, you know, for... Um, 20 years, um, at least as long as I've been following it, maybe 21 years. But if one just tracks the projects and those projects that are reviewed at Planning Commission, which are the only ones that we have public records of, and which I can say I, I have seen go by. When we are stuck trying to make a comment uh, about a project that we'd rather not see built, um, just as Menlo Park uh, community members, we almost always are left wishing that we had design guidelines. 
So much of what we see coming to planning commission, certainly the majority of what we see coming to planning commission is an addition to the neighborhood, especially when it knocks down a humble 1950 home in disrepair. Um, but that's not all that's out there. Um, and I think we may find some alternative um, construction ideas, particularly with this opportunity to build small units on, on a common residential lot. Um, what we see day to day in Palo Alto and Menlo Park is mostly very nice. Um, even the 1950s homes were nice at the time. Most of them are kept up after all. Someone bought a humble 1950s home on 5,000 square feet for $1.6 million. So they keep it up. But that's not all that's built. And for those who have visited um, North Fair Oaks, um, you can see that if someone purchases a lot and has limited means and limited access or desire for access for design references, a lot of things get designed by the property owner and built by unlicensed contractors. We're sort of not supposed to know that here in the city, but um, smaller residential construction is, is um, dominated by uh, contractors who have never done an apprenticeship. So we should be, as the responsible parties here, outlining the rules, just as you do for rules of most things. You don't say, well, everybody does it wrong, therefore I need rules. The issue is that every now and then someone needs guidance. And that's what you write rules for. I think we need to look at design guidelines. How much we want to adopt is going to be a matter of the will and determination of this body if we do that. But design guidelines are not a strange unknown and certainly not an unfair thing. If anything, they're more fair. Um, so design guidelines of different types targeting different concerns are already written and adopted by our sister cities, a number of our cities, sister cities. We can be looking at them and select what might apply for us. Personally, I think these design guidelines should apply to all residences to be built in Menlo Park. But we only have in front of us the SB9 scope. But I think we would be remiss not to address the issue, especially since once we pass the SB, these ordinances in re response to SB9, I'm concerned that the state would find us out of compliance if we subsequent to establishing our ordinances came back one year or two years later and said, oh, you know, we meant to say that um, you, you can't have that much paving in your front yard. In this case, we nailed that one, and I'm very grateful for that. But there are surely a dozen other issues that we should at least consider. So um, I realize timing is an issue, but there are design guidelines out there. I believe we should review them. We are fortunate to have a very capable uh, consulting architect. Um, and I think we should make use of this resource and see what we can pin down. So that's my one person's opinion. Um, but I do think this is the opportunity and I do think we are the ones that are obliged.
Okay, thank you, Commissioner Riggs. I see Commissioner Barnes has his hand up. He would like to speak now. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I would welcome the opportunity to participate in that design guideline process. And what I want to make sure is clear is that um, the notion that design guidelines create an impediment is frankly not the case, or the notion that design guidelines add unreasonable cost is also um, not the case when in fact design guidelines offer a um, best practice in a community for uh, for construction and design of a particular uh, within a community. Now it says it doesn't have anything to do with structure. It just has to do with facade and some of the architectural elements. So without creating an impediment in terms of extra cost and without creating an impediment in terms of extra time, it is, uh, I believe, incumbent upon this body in that we're looking at densifying, we're looking at increasing um, the number of units on the lot dramatically from one to four. And to do that concurrently without paying attention to the fabric of a community uh, from a compatibility standpoint, uh, I think misses what uh, a central, misses an opportunity. And we will look back on it and be like, and, and look at a missed opportunity to actually support and help this process by creating a, a through path for what can be built where and what it, um, in order to be compatible can look like for better acceptance in the community. Because uh, the last thing I think that we want is to have projects which are wholly incompatible with the fabric of a community and create the wrong, um, the wrong inputs where the lack of design um, sensitivity gets conflated with adding uh, more units. We can add units and we can increase households and we can increase access to housing and we can do all that. And we can also create a better glide path if we've got um, the construction of dwellings which are compatible with the community. And I think that's our responsibility. Um, so I uh, echo the need for compatibility, and I reinforce that it does not have to create any barrier. Conversely, it can create um, uh, standardization or guidelines which assist in development. Um, so I second that heartily. Um, and I'll take a I'll take a moment because. Uh, I don't see other hands up to make a motion and of course not to preclude any additional uh, discourse on this particular topic, but to uh, make a first to adopt the resolution uh, recommending that we approve this ordinance um, amending titles 15 and 16 to the Menlo Park Municipal Code you know, and as further called out in the staff report. Um, and I'll make a first, and I believe there'll be one or two seconds associated with it, but I'll put a first on the table. Um, and if I need the detail, uh, actually, with the, let me let me go further than that. With the, the two conditions I'd like to offer, uh, in addition, is one, uh, provisions for in this uh, recommendation, uh, this resolution recommending is one, the condo subdivision and can talk further with staff on what the correct languaging of that is uh, with Mr. Turner's guidance. Um, and then also offer uh, some language as it relates to design standards. So that would be my first. Uh, okay, thank you, Commissioner Barnes. Um, I haven't spoken yet and I will, but I'd like to give an opportunity to some folks that haven't spoken yet. I uh, I'm not in agreement with uh, some of the some of the items. Um, 
I do value um, Commissioner Burns bringing up the condo subdivisions. I think that would be a terrific add. Um, I now see a hand from, from Commissioner Tate. So if you would like to take the floor. Okay, I can wait until you're finished. Well, I have a number of things. So why don't you go ahead? Thank you. Yeah, I'm thinking I may have some of the same ones. Um, so I still, I feel like um, the ordinance is still too restrictive. Um, the daylight plane for sure that um, our resident um, Misha mentioned earlier, and also the setbacks. Um, and I'm, although we did hear from the consultant, I'm not sure whether or not um, the questions were fully answered. Um, and whether or not there is any flexibility or, or exceptions within that um, rear setback. And I'm looking from the, from the eye of uh, lots that are at that 5,000, 5,750. 5, and um, to be able to work with those lots, the existing setbacks would have to be in play. So I don't know. I, I, and I think there's a few other areas for me. And at this point, I don't think I support this at all unless I hear something a little further on down the line tonight. Thank you. Thank you, um, Commissioner Tate. Uh, Commissioner Barnes, your hand is still up and I didn't know if you had something new or if it was um, from the board. I do not, thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, I'd like to bring up a couple things. You know, overall, our goal is to make sure to ensure that we're consistent with SB nine. Um, so I have a concern that there are going to be many situations where homeowners are just not going to be able to fit that two times eight hundred square feet units um, on these small lots. Um, it seems that we're kind of squeezing a little bit because we have. The step back, which reduces the ability of the homeowner for some square footage. At the same time, we have these restrictions about where you can and can't park, which also restricts um, where and how the home is put together. So my concern is that if we are um, making these different restrictions, we're going to end up with a lot of situations where the homeowner is going to come back and say, you guys have to give me some relief um, based on SB9. So that, that's kind of one of my biggest concerns, um, especially with these, especially with these smaller lots. I do really value um, all of the work that's been going, going on into this. It's really hugely helpful to have um, these site development examples. I also think that the, um, the zero lot line is very creative. I like the idea Idea that a tandem would be allowed, but because of the way that these smaller lots are, it would actually be required. And I don't think we re can require a homeowner that wants to split their lot and put their two 800 square feet uh, units on both sides. If the only way they can do that is by having tandem parking, I don't think that that's fair to the homeowner. Um, so I love the idea of offering that but I don't think it is something that we can require. And while we're not stating that we require it, if we have all of these restrictions, we are in, in essence um, gonna require it. So that's um, my biggest, one of my biggest concerns. The other concern that I have just in general about SB9 is I, I guess I was hoping that SB9 was gonna fix one of the problems that I think we have in this area, which is that it makes more sense for a developer to come in and buy a lot and tear down the older home and build one giant home than it is for them to build two moderate size homes on these, on the, I would say the bigger lots, right? So you have a 10,000 square foot lot and wouldn't it be great if instead of putting this giant house on it, um, that I would say is not in the fabric of our community, as um, Commissioner Barnes stated. Um, and I was hoping that, that this SB9 would help us with that situation. So I kind of was 
um, thinking about how that could work with a developer if maybe instead of splitting a lot, they could build two homes and then later the homeowner could come and buy them both and then split the lot and sell it to the other person. But we, I don't, I don't, unfortunately, I don't see how SB9 can be a mechanism for this. And so I thought I would just bring that up in case any of the other commissioners have an idea of how we might incent, incentivize homeowners or builders to, to build two moderate homes versus building one giant home. I know that we could probably work on the fee structures because um, I think right now, if you build two homes, you're going to be paying kind of double on some of these things. It's going to take you a lot longer time. Um, but so that's one of the things that I guess I had hoped SB9 was going to fix. Um, just as perhaps um, Commissioner Riggs was hoping that um, design guidelines would be fixed through SB9. And I, I'm not in favor of that only because it's going to be, I don't want to have different restrictions for current homeowners than we have for these new homeowners, as an aside. So that's my other big um, kind of big issue is, is there a way that we could help um, help developers or homeowners build two uh, homes on one lot? I have a couple other things, but I want to leave it there in case others have um, some additional comments. So I want to make some comments. <laughs> Commissioner Schindler. <laughs> um, thank you, Vice Chair Harris. Um, I will riff on a couple of things that, that have previously been mentioned. And then I do have one, I suppose maybe be a clarifying question to, to staff. Um, I, um, I think, I think it was Commissioner Barnes who said he would welcome the opportunity to serve on a, a, an effort to develop design standards, um, and I also would volunteer to to be part of that effort. I think it could be it could be beneficial in a number of different contexts. Um, things that I've heard and been part of during my brief tenure here, and things that I had heard about prior to joining this commission. Um, but as as Vice Chair Harris mentioned, I don't think this is the moment because I think the state's been very clear that we don't have different standards as it relates to SB9 use cases than other development use cases. Um, so I think when we do it, when we have developed design standards, we need to be sure that we are comprehensive of all the use cases, including SB9 um, use cases, but then everything else in the city. Um, all right, we got a we got a thumbs up. We got a thumbs up. Um, and being being the newest member of the council, perhaps I can ask a question at some point later about where this is on on priorities and agenda. Um, the question that I had, it's, so Vice Chair Harris alluded to there being a number of restrictions and particular and anticipating that there will be instances where homeowners come to us and say, um, these restrictions make it almost impossible to develop the 800 square feet. And they come, they come in looking for relief. What's the process for relief? Is it a variance accomplished through us, through planning commission, or is, or, you know, in the spirit of, of SB9, is this a variance that comes through engagement with just, with, with only staff? Um, all right, that's a good question. I'll try my hand at it and then maybe uh, I'll on Mary Wagner from our city attorney's office. Um, but SB9 um, has uh, a provision where um, it allows for administrative relief from the development standards. Um, so if there is a case, and obviously we we did a lot of uh, studying of these properties, but only um, looked at more regularly shaped lots. There's going to be a situation where the development standards don't work um, for whatever reason. It's a triangle lot. It's a funky shaped lot. Um, in that case, um, applicants can ask staff for administrative relief from the standards. Um, and it is it does it wouldn't go through a variance process um, in the planning to the at the planning commission to, the, to follow that um, that non-subjective nature of uh, SB nine. 
Um, so they, they would have to show us that it, it is you know impossible to develop a um, an SB9 project uh, with the that complies with the objective design standards, and then we could work with them at a staff level to um, come up with some form of relief. Thank you. That's 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 helpful. Uh, um, would we like Miss Wagner? Yeah, did you want to weigh in on that? I think you're muted. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, I would second what you just heard from staff and you know concur that SB9 specifically says you cannot impose objective planning standards that would have the effect of precluding the development of the 800 square foot minimum um, unit. So you know, we can't create objective planning standards that have that effect. So if they generally do not, but and applied in a specific situation, they would we would not be able to impose that standard on that particular development. Um, so to be absolutely certain that I'm understanding the an example of a use case that we're talking about here is the setbacks. Um, and so if, if there were a unusually shaped lot, for example, a triangle or some, some of the, something with a strange angle, not a perfect rectangle, that makes it difficult to follow the excellent guidelines in these examples that have been diagrammed out in the document. And they come to, and, and the applicant comes to us and says, we cannot accomplish 800 square feet. The setback is no longer applicable, essentially. Correct. Right. Yeah, I mean, if it, there's, but uh, just to be clear, there's a dip, there's a difference between difficult and impossible. Correct. So if it's not the preferred you know, design that the applicant might want, that's a different discussion than it's physically precluded. And and it falls to staff to, to make that very difficult, I would imagine, boundary between difficult and impossible. Right. <laughs> okay. Right. And, and if some if a project does not qualify under SB9, yeah, you know, it, it then um, that would be the answer. But if a standard, a particular standard imposed on a particular development precludes that development uh, from allowing the minimum development allowed under SB9, then it wouldn't be allowed to be applied. So that was a lot of double negatives. It must be close to 11 o'clock. <laughs> I'm sorry, can you repeat that last part again? Okay, so if you have an objective planning standard that you've, you've created in this ordinance to apply to an SB9 project, that objective planning standard cannot have the effect of physically precluding the development of two 800 square foot units on a single family lot. Okay. I will continue my to make sure that I've, I've got it. Even if those standards are the ones that were set forth by the state. Well, the state applies minimums, right? So you, or maximums, for example, for setbacks. You can't require more than an X foot setback. You could require less, but you can't require more. Then the state imposes a minimum development size. You can't require smaller than an 800 square foot unit, but you can allow greater. And so if we had standards that said there was a four foot back rear setback on both the first floor and the second floor. And for some reason that's still because of the unusual conditions or the unusual shape of the lot that were particular to that lot, mm -hmm. prevented them from getting the 800 square feet with that 400, with that four foot setback still apply. I think the answer to your question is we would try and develop relief from that standard. And the only hesitation, Commissioner Schindler, is I'm looking, you know, there's a difference between the imposed requirements of SB9 or the imposed minimums of SB9 and the objective planning standards adopted by the city. But I think that that is a correct statement. If the four foot setback would have, would result in an inability to develop an 800 square foot uh, unit or two 800 square feet units, we would have to provide some relief from that standard. Thank you. I, I think I'm getting a little too into the weeds just with regard to specific use cases. 
but I will I will pull up for a minute and just say this feels like there could be um, an ineffective feedback loop um, given that we would develop the, these these standards, these ordinances. And if it turns out that in many or even most of the application, the, the SB9 applications that come in, we get they get challenged. How will we know? Like, I guess, will the planning commission be in a position to have to reevaluate the ordinances? Um, and if so, how will we do our job effectively? Not that I'm asking for them to come to us. I'm just trying to be sure we don't leave. We don't, we don't catch the ball if it's, if it's being thrown to us. Right. Um, so I think the, the best answer would be we we can't, there's no way for for us to study every every lot. There are going to be exceptions. Um, we did our best to study the most common and the most um some of the most extreme examples, particularly the the 50 by 100 um, is a very typical um lot in R1U particularly. Um, and it is very small, so it, there are constraints, but we made sure to develop standards that, that work, um, that would not preclude um, developments of 800 square feet for the two units um, in, in a lot of cases, um, some cases more than that. Um, so, I, I see what you're saying as, as far as the feedback loop, we, we don't want to have too many exceptions, but we, we did our best and, and did a lot of, of analysis to make sure it would work for the majority um, of projects that come through. Thank you. Also, I think, think the diagram and the analysis are very thorough. I mostly just want to be sure that if there are things that the Planning Commission can do to support the ongoing iterations here, we're doing our job. Thank you, Commissioner Schindler. I have another question along those lines, but perhaps Commissioner Tate does as well. Would you, either I can finish if it's the same line of questioning or if you want to go ahead. Um, you can go ahead because it's probably the same. <laughs> okay, so uh, along the lines of Ms. Schindler's questions, if I look at the attachment F example 1A again, um, and it, maybe you want to pull that back up again, the one where you have the two versions. Um, I am wondering, I don't see, a, I guess I don't, I'm not seeing the version for the 500 or the 5,000 square foot lot that makes it work without parking in tandem and without um, changing the step back. So I'm just concerned that there is there an option because I think that we, we have a lot of 5,000 square foot lots and I'm just not seeing an option to either A, not have the, I, I, I know we don't want these four um, spaces in the front and the setback, but what if the homeowner doesn't want to have Panda? I, I don't, I'm not seeing how that, what that might look like. So maybe this is a question to um, our city architect. Yeah, I, I would just uh, to Arnold on this one. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's an excellent question. I studied this lot and really when doing small lots with multiple uh, units on them, access to the lot for parking is one of the biggest constraints and difficulties in planning. And it was very difficult to come up with a feasible design uh, that had non-tandem parking on this interior lot. The corner lot was much easier because you have access from, from two, two sides. Uh, panhandle lots does not work at all on, on this type of small lot. It's just, it's, it just is not a, a uh, workable option. So you're really kind of stuck with this uh, split down this center type lot. 
you can extend the driveway deep into the rear yard and, and do something like that and arrange the units slightly differently. But um, any covered parking, if you, if you tuck the parking under the building, then the parking might become square footage. So that's kind of, kind of a, a, a limitation. So it's possible, but you would lose a lot of yard area to, to, to get an, an, a non-tandem and it's right on the edge of, of possibility with 800 to 800 square foot units. So uh, this is the most difficult situation. What do you think the state's intention was for what they might, if they were gonna give an example and, and maybe they haven't, I haven't found it, but if the state were to, cause there are a lot of 5,000 square foot lots in the state. So I'm just wondering if they're, what the state would say and number one and number two, if if the step back for the second floor were uh, changed uh, and reduced, would that make a difference? It might. Uh, to, to answer your second question, uh, if the step backs uh, were changed, it might make a difference. But getting cars past each other is is the trickiest part of a of a tandem. Yeah, car for one unit has to pass the parking space for the other unit. That's that's the trickiest part. So, if the step back requirements of were changed, I would have to study that again to see if there was an approach that could um, do a non tandem parking situation. But you would be using a lot of the area of lot for basically driveway, and that has some drawbacks too. Uh, your first question, I really don't have an answer for that. I don't know if, uh, if if Mr. Turner does either about what the state was expecting to see. They may not have looked at that closely. Okay. Any thoughts or knowledge of what the state might recommend in this situation? Right. Um, so the, the intent of the state, um, you know, parking is obviously expensive and, and can be constrained. So they, they wanted to remove that as much as possible. Um, they likely assumed on-street parking is allowed. Um, okay. So that's a bit of a unique constraint here in the park. Um, but in terms of the objective standard, um, as long as it doesn't include the, the development, um, I don't think they would have an issue with that. Okay. Um, so I would say that I, I, I don't feel comfortable at this point if we don't have a good option that we can all agree on for a 5,000 square foot lot, because I think we're going to get a lot of people coming back and saying, hey, I need some relief. I can't. I can't fit this in this lot, and I have a right to under SB9. Um, so that is, I don't want to be in the weeds, but I feel like in order to make something, in order to get up, we have to get down here a little bit, especially in these smaller lots. <clears throat> I also, um, I, I do like some of the ideas of the uh, not so much concrete in the front, Although I would not be in favor of regulating it, um, just because it is different than the regulations for current um, single family zone homes. Um, and I thought about my own home and we had a particular problem where the tree was in the middle of where we wanted the driveway to go and we didn't want to lose the tree so we made a circle drive. And I think if I were to add up this, I think I would not pass the some of these bullets of, of the ideas um, that came up. I'm pretty sure I would not pass. And, you know, I, I personally think it looks fine and we have lots of landscaping, but I don't know if I would meet these restrictions. And if a single family home doesn't have those restrictions, I don't think it's fair to make this, um, this SB9 projects have those um, stipulations. So I, I would be willing to entertain other ideas. I don't think we're there quite there yet on that. I'm now realizing uh, that as chair, it's now three minutes to one. Uh, I am, if, if we could, I, I don't think we're going to get there tonight. I'm kind of feeling a little bit less certain. I, I mean, I, I'm willing to go later, but I don't, I don't want us to go until one o'clock in the morning if we're not going to get there, right? So um, 
at this point, I think we need to take a vote to see whether we can go later, and if so, how much later. I would be, I would entertain any um, ideas from other commissioners on that. Commissioner Riggs. Yeah, I would entertain half an hour if it's a strict half an hour, um, and leave it up to you and staff to judge whether we have that much more to go. Uh, I do feel everyone's spoken at least once, um, but I also think that it might not hurt us to be able to, so to speak, sleep on a couple of things. Um, I, I know that I have a response to a couple of things, and one of the things I decided not to bring up actually relates to the parking. Um, so um, I do agree with you. There's just some things yet to be said. Okay, do we have a recommendation from staff? I don't think we're going to get to a resolution tonight. It might be good, as as Commissioner Riggs says, to get a few, make sure we have kind of everybody's ideas out, and then um, probably have to postpone finishing this. Um, half an hour would, would definitely help. Um, any sort of feedback or discussion that um, you know maybe brings us closer to a, a resolution. Um, definitely helpful. Um, I, I do think there is a motion on the table as well. Um, so just want to point that out. Um, oh, that's right. Sorry. Okay, so I would um, entertain a motion to go to, I think a motion to go to 1130. I, I don't know if that's going to be realistic for everybody. Um, would somebody I'm, I'm happy to put that motion on the table. I'm going to stay for another 30 minutes and then call it at 20, the 25 after take a Figure out where we are. Yeah. Okay. Um, a strict 30 minutes. Does anyone want to second that? Uh, Commissioner Riggs. Okay, let's take a vote. Commissioner Barnes. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Doe. Yes. Commissioner Riggs. Yes. Commissioner Schindler. Yes. Commissioner Tate. Yes. Okay, thanks, and I and I I agree too. All right, so a uh, strict thirty minutes. I've got two hands in the air, and I have one motion on the table. So um, I think Commissioner Barnes, your hand was up first, and then I'd like to hear from Commissioner Tate, unless you would like to uh, uh, let Commissioner Tate go first. Uh, my question would be: Has Commissioner Tate spoken yet? And if not, I'm happy to have her go. Okay, uh, Commissioner. Uh I have spoken previously. Okay, then I will. Um, if it's okay with you, I'll just proceed. Yeah, okay, Commissioner Burr. Uh So this is a question to to staff. So I can contextualize this discussion about what to do with the front of the the parcel and whether it's allocated towards parking or whether it's allocated towards landscaping and where the parking goes what we're um, most importantly dealing with is the minimum requirement for for landscaping and then where and I apologize I'm looking in the staff report and I think it was 40 percent um, actually if you'd be so kind if, if you're able to bring up that slide that shows the um, numbers on for the proposal for uh, what goes on in the front of the front of the site from a percentage perspective, landscaping versus hardscape for paving. Got it. Okay. So as it relates to where the cars go, really, well, correct me, please, if I'm misunderstanding this, the the, the driving metric is. Maximum fifty per, maximum forty percent of the front yard area um, allowed to be paved. The rest going towards you know not that utilization. So how they how folks figure out what they do with their parking, it's less a function of tandem or not tandem. That it's more a function of having a minimum requirement for what is the landscape portion of it, and then um, if they if they had a house. If they had a, a development which had two 
sets of tandem parking right next to each other, that's up to them as long as it fits within the setback requirements. Um, actually, there aren't any as it relates to the parking, but they could ostensibly move two sets of tandem to the right and have landscaping on the side. We're not prescriptive on how, these are just illustrative examples of what needs to happen in the front. We're not saying it has or has not to be, it, it must or must not be tandem, correct? Correct, it's, it's not a requirement for tandem parking, it's, it's an allowance. Right, so, so I think, um, I think our discussion is less about uh, trying to formulate iterations of how the site planning might be and more about what are, what's the minimum benchmark for, um, you know, paving versus not paving. And I think that's the discussion um, that, that's relevant here. Um, the other question I have, and this is a question to Mr. Mamorella, uh, who has deep experience in um, design standards. And, uh, and frankly, I don't have a huge dog in the design standards fight other than um, wanting to make for communities that work. And uh, I'll ask the question here in a, in a moment, Mr. Mamorello, but just to kind of give a, a context, we say that we don't want to, have design standards um, in place that aren't currently in place. In fact, this is for anyone who has less than a 7,000 square foot lot that is contemplating a development like we're talking about here, which is a scrape and a rebuild, there's design review that the use permit process has. So the de facto process, and anyone who's been through a use permit process uh, knows that it is a painful process at best. Uh, and there's a lot of input on design. What we're saying, I think, from a design standard perspective is we're not going to make you go through all of that. But given that we're going from one unit to four units and the impact of your design decisions can be profound on a neighborhood, we're going to make it easy and we're going to create design guidelines for this process. But we're not going to put you through a use permit process because SB9 doesn't require it. But it's a heck of a lot easier, I will say, uh, having design guidelines than it is going through a use permit process, which is an overview of design. So no, in fact, I don't think we're adding new layers. I think we're, I think we're creating a much lower burden on a much denser proposition for for construction. But with that, um, with that little, with that context, um, Mr. Mamarillo, what is your experience in terms of uh, design guidelines in residential neighborhoods, the ease or lack thereof of having ones that work efficiently to help folks and help communities um, create cohesive neighborhoods, but at the same time, not add cost and not add barriers to development and not add time. What's been your experience in that area? Uh, thank you for that question. I think there's like three levels. The one level is you don't really have design guidelines, but you have a process like a, a use permit. And then it's they, they um, put forth their proposal and then uh, some body comments on that proposal without any really, really guidance. The second level is you have guidelines, which are sort of more performance criteria. Maybe they're illustrated. Uh, you see that often for single family neighborhoods and they're fairly effective at pointing people in the right direction, but they do require a somewhat process intensive approach to sort of fine tune things. Uh, and you use illustrations that give people ideas about what you would like, but you don't narrowly define like a prescriptive solution. It has to be a certain way. Those type of guidelines couldn't be applied here is the only problem because we have to have objective design standards. So that's the third layer. And you could start to look at specific things that you highly value and say, for example, you could say we want uh, entries that uh, to the building face the street for houses that face the street in this development. Or you could say, we want a certain amount of, of landscaping along interior property edges. You could come up with certain things like that or things where you say, for example, you are restricted to using only up to two 
types of roof forms or two types of roof pitches. These are things that happen in, in your neighboring city to the south um, that we've developed sort of objective standards to sort of s simulate guidelines that, that that city has. So there are things you can do, but it's mostly about you guys setting the priorities about what's the most important to you. One more comment. Um, they can provide good direction. You can always end up with someone finding ways to do design that you're not happy with. Um, but they don't necessarily uh, add cost to a, a project or they don't necessarily, um, you know, add a complication depending on what you want to propose. But it's sort of, a, you know, obviously some work to get to there, what's important to you and making sure that that's put down on paper. And this is a subjective question, but have you found... Um, I'm sorry, frame this. I mean, basically, I want to ask if if you thought they have been a good idea in terms of um, the fabric of a of a of a neighborhood without being onerous. Um, are you able to opine on that, or is that a little bit beyond your scope? Sure, I would like to opine on that. Sure, I think uh, from the point of view of maybe homeowners and architects or developers in the process, they would probably consider any process or any constraint onerous. I, I think it's um, not necessarily overly onerous as long as they come into the process and are, are, are trying to work with whatever the city puts forward and whatever the city puts forward is is really well, you know, really well uh, described. Uh, but I certainly think that most architects would say we would prefer to ha have none. But I also think they're of value to the community. So you have to weigh those things. Okay, I appreciate that, and I thank you for that. And to the rest of my colleagues, I don't, I didn't have a predetermined answer on that. I was curious about the effectiveness of that. Um, those are my questions. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Memorella. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll move now to Commissioner T. <laughs> okay, so, um, so. In regards to the design standard standards, um, would it be uh, more uh, uh, palatable for people and um, to just offer something like the county offers and um, San Diego offers for ADUs where there are uh, designs that are already paid for up on the website. People can just get those and, and run with it. Um, so having sample designs instead, and especially with our, our tricky uh, 5,000 square foot lots. So that's just a thought as opposed to having um, a design standard that um, um, is highly likely to discourage people from uh, building. And, um, and that is similar to uh, whether or not we would be hearing or there would be a lot of challenges to um, the city's ordinance. And I wonder, um, because it's unfortunate that a lot of times information doesn't get out, I would hate for a lot of projects to not even come to fruition because folks think that it's like climbing Mount Everest with what the ordinances are and being unaware that they can come and ask for an administrative exception because it's impossible for them to be able to move forward with their plans. So, so that information, making sure that that information is out in the community to not prohibit people from moving forward um, is a concern of mine. And especially in communities um, of color uh, where folks are, are challenged anyway with really getting their arms around uh, dealing with the city and the planning uh, department and, and just making sure that they understand what's available to them. And also about this parking, um, didn't we say, or, or in staff's presentation, uh, one of the restrictions was you, you couldn't park in the front setback. I think that was the, the uh, diagram on the left. And um, to me, that seems like that would be um, more desirable on these small lots that uh, to have the parking out there as opposed to tandem uh, inside the lot. So I'm having trouble just trying to visualize all this and, and um, 
with the size and width of the, of the smaller lots. So those are, are some of my things that I wanted to um, offer up here and, and really just try to get an understanding around this uh, design standard versus just offering um, examples to people. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Tate. Uh, yeah, if we were as a city to have um, examples where people could come and say, okay, if I do if I do exactly this, then I know it's going to work. I realize that's a little bit tough because all the lots are different shapes and sizes, but um, to the extent that we had some workable designs that people could uh, uh, choose from, um, that might be something that would uh, get us get us to a place where many of us could, could be happy. Um, all right, it's now 1114. And I think we've probably given um, staff a lot of thoughts, but I don't know yet if we are any closer to a motion um, than we were 17 minutes ago. Um, so I guess I would like a recommendation from staff um, uh, or if somebody thinks they can come up with a motion uh, that could pass, um, I would be happy to entertain either of those. Uh, well, actually, how about from staff first, and then while staff you're speaking, maybe some of the commissioners might think if there's a way that we might um, get a motion. Yeah, I think um, with a lot of upcoming projects, it would be useful um, to have a motion tonight or um, an action by the Planning Commission. Um, since this is just a recommendation to the um, City Council, there could be the motion could include a recommendation to consider um, a certain aspect of the draft ordinance. Okay, let's see. Uh, through the chair? Yes. We need to find a way to, for people who are present to put up their hands or something. I know, I'm really. Well, it, 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 you, look it this way. used to be a red light right here, even though it was hard to see, but anyway. Um, so maybe I have a concept. Uh, the, the things that I skipped over earlier included, um, can we, for these units, exempt carports from the FAL, for example? Um, a carport can be used as a design element besides the fact that if you tuck under a second story cantilever, you don't want the city saying, oh, well, then now it's a carport and it's square footage. Um, so that actually, I think, might add some flexibility. Um, and I was also going to suggest that where we have short blocks, such as 69 Cornell, about two and a half hours ago, that we uh, automatically change the setback there also. Um, I, I'm going to be so bold. I know this isn't going to make any friends, but I think at some point, the city needs to have design guidelines. They would serve us at this DS greatly. They would serve applicants, not every applicant, not even a majority of applicants, but a lot of difficult ones come here. And they have two observations. One is, how was I supposed to know that? And the other is, well, why should I do it, not somebody else? there should be guidelines. I mean, there should be rules. Um, I think at some point we're going to have to get over the fact that the first enacting of new guidelines is not going to be fair to the people that had their approvals last year. But then you may not feel that your taxes are fair compared to the people who bought 10 years ago. I mean, things are different. But potentially one solution might be, since it's our job to make a recommendation to city council, is that we say, 
Yes, we would like to recommend this. We also have a recommendation about uh, making condominiumization easier. And we would like to urge council at this time to adopt design guidelines for the entire town for residential. I think that overcomes the issue of fairness. And I think it's something that's long overdue. And I don't know, although the city, uh, the, the planning commission has in the past made that statement, it's been several years and it's gone the same way as improving the bridge over San Francisco Creek over the last 25 years. Um, would, would this body, would the maker of the motion entertain adding to his motion, asking that council entertain design guidelines at this time? Uh, is that to me, Commissioner Riggs, to the chair? Please. Thank you for that. Um, so, uh, noting that we are doing a uh, recommendation on a resolution and knowing um, that the best way to approach this is with an open handed approach. So, my focus was specifically on the SB9 project because it creates a unique situation where you're putting four where there was one. Um, I'm more inclined, uh, obviously, to, to have that be the applicable part of it. I think if it was worded in such a way where it says we encourage council to consider the applicability of design guidelines in specific for SB9 and uh, and in addition, more broadly, for the city as a whole, I think that covers both bases. Um, and again, it's it's you know the, the premise of it is there may be validity to doing this, and it warrants more discussion, and it should be elevated to the council. Um, and I think that accomplishes that. And it would just see if there's enough agreement among um, fellow commission members that having the applicability of that be something that council looks at is a worthy endeavor. Uh, I, yes, I think um, I would word it in such a way that I just did. Um, and I think that, from my standpoint, I think that covers it. Do we have a second? We currently do not. I would like it to second Mr. Barnes' motion. Can, can you restate it and clarify? Just be sure that I've got all of the nuance of what's been proposed. On top of, or is it on top of, or conditional approval of of the proposed um, recommendation is conditional upon these things, or is are these recommendations to council on top of accepting staff's recommendation? I'm guessing since it's a recommendation by the humble commission to the Almighty Council that in both cases they're recommendations. Okay. Um, would it be appropriate, Madam Chair, to um, have staff? read back their understanding of the motion. That's an excellent idea. Could staff please uh, <laughs> read back the recommendation of the, the motion for the recommendation put forth by um, Commissioner Barnes and seconded by Commissioner Riggs? I will do my best. Um, so the recommendation would be to approve the implementing SB9 ordinance. Um, also recommend that um, provisions for administrative review of condominium, condominium subdivision um, is included as part of the ordinance. Um, and to include a recommendation that the city council um, study or adopt um, design guidelines for SB9. I, I do wanna clarify one thing. Um, for purposes of SB9, they would have to be design, objective design standards. So a little bit different from guidelines, um, similar vein. Um, is that 
cover in. There's a, there's lots in um, through the chair. As the maker, I'm happy to head. weigh in if that's okay. Sorry, yes, Commissioner Burns is the maker. Why thank you. Head? So. Thank you for that, Mr. Turner. I think the first part is spot on about the, the, condom, the ministerial approval of the condom mapping. The second part is making it slightly more open-handed, which is having the council consider the applicability of objective design standards specifically for SB9 projects and, and in addition, more broadly, um, the city as a whole. So it leaves it open to studying the applicability of or the benefit of. That's how I would, um, that's how I propose it be worded it. And I'd go back to the, the seconder to see if that level of slight um, ambiguity uh, is okay with Mr. with Commissioner Riggs. I think we're thinking on the same page. Um, I was going to go back to the beginning and note that our action tonight is to make a recommendation to city council on the ordinance. So we would recommend that we would semicolon then recommend that uh, uh, an ordinance provide that condominiums be administratively approved for SB9 projects, semicolon. And then we would recommend the, I think we have to be bold and say creation of design standards for the SB9 content, which, however, would apply citywide. Mr. Barnes, does that sound suitable? Um, yeah, I, I think I think it's a slightly bridge too far in terms of prescriptive. I, I would like to because I think there's a little bit more um, review. To go into whether it's actually a good idea or not and i would like to it to be phrased along the lines of consider the applicability of or the benefits of um that, that design guidelines for me yeah yeah that way we leave it open yeah. and it covers everything okay um uh, we have a motion on the floor and we have a second um so we need to take a vote um so let's do that, um, Commissioner Barnes. And I just want to make sure that staff is okay with how we currently have it. Is that Mr. Turner? Uh, you are you clear enough on what we've been saying that you um, feel comfortable with it? Your understanding of it? Uh, yes. yes, yes, we feel comfortable. Great. Um, thank you for that, and thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, I'm a yes. Okay, Commissioner Dow. Yes. Um, Commissioner Riggs. Yes. I'm having trouble with the alphabet. Um, Commissioner Schindler. Yes. Okay, C Commissioner Tate. No. And I'm also a no. Uh, so I guess it's four to two. So the motion passes. So I guess that's it. We can move on. Um, okay. So the last order of business is informational items. Um, the uh, future planning commission meeting schedule. Um, I my understanding is that the, the meeting on January 23rd is for Parkline, and then the special meeting we have for the housing element on January 2nd, 12th, later this week. Um, are there any other um, announcements um, from Ms. Sandmeyer? Yeah, just to clarify, so the, the meeting on the 12th this Thursday is the joint meeting of the Planning Commission and Housing Commission. And then the next regular meeting will be in two weeks, January 23rd. And on that um, agenda, we have three single family homes and then the parkline study session. Okay. Um, and just to be clear for the for the combined meeting, are we gonna be in this room? Yes, it'll be in the council chambers and um, it'll be a hybrid meeting just like this meeting. So 
people will be able to participate remotely or in the chambers. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you. I think that I would like to thank everyone who stayed up late, and um, I think we're adjourned. Thanks. Thank you. Night. Thank you.